Number 10, Chevy Chase. Chevy Chase, a popular man thanks to National Lampoon and Saturday Night Live, but he returned to the mainstream when he starred as Pierce Hawthorne in the hit sitcom Community. I genuinely love this show. Chevy? Not so much. And it would appear that his community co-stars would agree with that statement. Around the middle of the show's runtime, Chevy started to complain about his co-stars, especially Mr. Glover. It became apparent that he was more than just angry with Donald, and it was eventually fired for using racial slurs against him. According to himself, aka Troy Barnes, Chevy would often make inappropriate jokes either aimed at him or as a general way to disrupt a scene. Joel McHale told People that before he was fired, Chevy was complaining about his character on the show and how he was being betrayed. The entire cast reminded him that there was no contract keeping him there, which may have been part of what set him off on set. His character was written out in truly humiliating fashion, with his life ending after feeding his geese way too much. If you know what I mean. He was playing with them. Number 9. Tom Hardy Mad Max Fury Road is a forgotten gem in cinema history. It featured little to no CGI, despite having some awesome visuals, and it featured some pretty cool performances from its cast, like Nicholas Holt, Charlize Theron, and Tom Hardy. Charlize and Tom played the main characters, Furiosa and Max, and while their on-screen characters end up working together in the end on set, it was a very different vibe. Tom had a bad habit of showing up late all the time. Meanwhile, Charlize was a brand new mother who would be there on time every day while their kids were forced to be taken care of by someone else. In a book called Red, Sweat, and Chrome, The Wild and True Story of Mad Max Fury Road, the writer Kyle Buchanan shared an instance on set between Charlize and Tom. Everyone was on set, 8 a.m., ready to shoot, except for Mr. Hardy. But at that point, Charlize took her place and stayed there until Tom showed up three hours later. Now, she didn't move a muscle, and according to the crew, she was beyond furious. When Tom finally showed up, she asked him how he could be so disrespectful and said that they should find this CNX Tuesday a hundred thousand dollars for every minute that he held up the crew. She didn't say see you next Tuesday. I really wish I could say the word that did set him off. The word she did say set Tom off and he rushed up to her and pulled out the whole what did you just say to me type thing. Yeah, he didn't say it like that. He's a big tough guy. Oh, big guff I can't hear so good. Overall, Charlize felt pretty threatened by Tom on set and had an assistant follower around as a buffer between them. When the shoot wrapped, the tension was gone and things seemed to have gotten better, but the difficult shoot combined with the stress is probably why Tom Hardy was never brought back for a man. Mad Max 2. Number 8. Jeremy Piven. Best known for his role as the timekeeper in Spy Kids 4D, All the Time in the World and nothing else, unfortunately has an overall rough reputation in the world of Hollywood, mainly being pegged as a very difficult man to work with. Several of his co-stars over the years have called out his wild behavior. When Kim Kardashian made a cameo appearance on some indie show called Entourage, I don't know, I've never heard of it, he was very pushy towards her trying to get her contact information. Several past girlfriends and co-stars like January Jones, Kelly Brook, and Rachel Hunter have all agreed that this guy plays the numbers game. He'll go out and get as many phone numbers as he can so that at the end of the night he can just text all of them at once and see who responds first. The most troubling incident came when he made a guest appearance on the sitcom Will and Grace, playing Grace's ex-boyfriend. Deborah Messing, who plays Grace, recalled to Andy Cohen, Watch What Happens Live, that her experience with Piven was just plain gross. She claims to have locked lips with a lot of boys in her time on stage and screen, and on the first day of rehearsals, Jeremy tried to get French with her, claiming that he tried to shove his tongue down to her heart. She told him to take it easy, but apparently he refused. Not a cool move at all, and very gross indeed. This man is so mean and self-centered that he once tipped a waiter with a DVD of The Entourage. Seriously, what? Is it like a late night cable television show or something? Ooh. I'm just kidding, I know what The Entourage is. Number 7, Mike Myers. Yeah baby, it's very shagadelic that Mike's on this list. Despite being a Canadian treasure and the man behind some comedy cult classics like Austin Powers and Wayne's World, this guy's actually apparently a menace on set. According to his Cat in the Hat co-star Amy Hill, Mike had handlers dress his entire trailer and his work area was entirely covered with tenting. Apparently he just didn't want anybody to see him physically, which, hey man, that's fair. If I was in that cat suit with a bum crack in it, I'd, I'd probably want to hide too. His reputation as a difficult Donnie might have something to do with Hollywood blacklisting him entirely, except for his recent show The Pentaverate, which was a show where he basically played half the cast because, yeah, he couldn't get anybody else to get on the show. I guess. It might be that or it might be the love guru. Who knows? Number six, Bill Murray. Now, Bill Murray has had many public feuds with many co-stars over the years that would qualify him as an entry on this list. One of his more famous feuds was with Charlie's Angel co-star Lucy Liu, but I already covered that in part one of this list. So today, I'm going to talk about his long-standing feud with his late Ghostbusters co-star, 
Harold Ramis. Harold and Bill famously start opposite of each other in the classic Ghostbusters series, but they had been working together before and after the project, with Harold acting as the director on a lot of projects starring Bill Murray. The moment he was outed as one of the meanest men on set was while filming Groundhog Day. According to cast and crew, Harold and Bill would regularly get into screaming matches over the way that a scene should be filmed or how a line should be set. According to Harold, who passed away in 2014, Bill would show up late to set, well past his call time. Following the film, the two did not speak to each other for decades. It wasn't until Harold was heading out the door that Bill decided to reconcile the friendship, but by then it was a little bit too late. Of course, in the years since, several co-stars, especially female ones, have come forward to call out his extreme temper and snappiness on set, but we could do a whole top 10 about things that Bill Murray has done. Number 5. Bruce Willis Now, Kevin Smith is a director, actor, and an absolute geek in the best of ways. In 2010, he collaborated with Bruce Willis on an action comedy called Cop Out, a story about two cops who get sucked into wild action packed shenanigans. I don't know, I've never seen the movie. According to Kevin Smith, his time on set as a director of the project was not good and it was mostly due to his childhood hero Bruce Willis telling him to snap out of it every time that he would mention his admiration. He went on to claim that Bruce was difficult to work with on set in general and that a lot of the time it just felt like he was messing up scenes on purpose to throw him off. Apparently, every time Kevin would try to, you know, do his job and direct Bruce Willis, he would just kind of tell him that he had been working in the industry for 25 years and that there was nothing that Kevin could tell him he didn't already know. He then revealed on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno back in 2012 that Bruce had actually confronted him after filming one day and asked him if he wanted to take a swing. The situation escalated to the point that Bruce didn't appear for promotional events or photo shoots, meaning that he was photoshopped into most of the pictures that you see him with with co-star Tracy Morgan, who Kevin claims is actually the only reason he didn't back out of the project. Since Willis was diagnosed with aphasia, the two have been able to patch things up, with Kevin apologizing for his petty complaints. Number 4. Ryan Gosling The Notebook is considered to be one of the better romantic movies ever made in Hollywood. Oddly enough though, the on-screen couple didn't get along at all during their shoot. Turns out they would constantly fight on set, and they seemed to have completely opposite ideas on how several of the scenes should play out. Ryan Gosling especially was a little bit of a problem. One day in particular was pretty exciting for anyone who wasn't involved. All drama watchers were sipping their tea. While Ryan called over the director and demanded that Rachel was replaced by another actress to read her lines. In front of 150 crew members, he claimed that Rachel just wasn't giving him anything to work with, and the two would constantly yell at each other. Their toxic onset feud somehow morphed into a relationship that lasted for like two years, but anyone who worked on the set blames them for the constant schedule setbacks and creating just a terrible work environment overall. So, I don't know. He seems better now that he's been in Barbie. Number 3. William Shatner This one is for all of you Trekkies out there. Live long and prosper. That's all I got. I'm not as geeky as one may think, but I'm well aware of this long-standing feud between William Shatner and his Star Trek co-star George Takai. This feud has lasted for over 50 years, and according to George, it boils down to William being a prima donna attention hog the entire time he was on set. Over the years, George has always been vocal about his opinion on his fellow Star Trek cast and crew. Most of the time, he has nothing but nice things to say and claims to have made lifelong friends from the project. But there is, of course, one that he despises, and it's William Shatner, who was the bane of everyone's existence on set. He loved being the center of attention and was apparently very self-involved. He wanted everyone to know who he was. William actually responded to these claims, telling people that he believed that Star Trek co-stars were damaging his good name for publicity's sake. But why would people who've barely acted in 30 years, like, suddenly want to bash you for fame and glory? I don't know if anyone has noticed or not, but William hasn't done much either in a while other than, you know, petition to go to space for real, so good for him. Number two, Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx has been a huge star in the world of Hollywood over the years, working with several acclaimed directors in basically every genre, but like most actors, Jamie had to start somewhere. And that somewhere was in the film Any Given Sunday from 1999, alongside Al Pacino, Cameron Diaz, Dennis Quaid, and Mr. LL Cool J. Cool J and Jamie played teammates in the football-centric flick, and not only do their characters constantly fight on screen, but behind the scenes, they had an actual brawl that ended in the Miami County Police being called in. During one scene, the two were scripted to fight and filmed the first two takes as planned, but just, you know, faking it. However, some offset beef made its way 
way in front of the camera when Jamie struck Cool J for real. Splitting his lip open and an all out beatdown took place, leaving Jamie unconscious and in the hospital. They had to stop production because they just weren't sure when Jamie would actually you know, come back to be able to film his scenes. When Fox did return to set, it was with a small crew of friends and his manager. Waiting to greet them was LL Cool J and half of Brooklyn, according to the director, who stated that the tension was only settled after the real life football players that the characters were based on came onto set and took care of business. And at number one, Sarah Jessica Parker. For this entry, I'm not allowed to say the title of the show that Sarah and her co-star Kim Cattrall were on, so I'll be referring to it as Schmex and the City, okay? Take the Schm and you know what, you'll figure it out. The Schmex and the City series is remembered for its larger than life fashion and flings. But even better than the show itself was apparently the dramatic onset feud between Sarah Jessica Parker and Kim Cattrall. There was merely speculation for a long time, but their feud was confirmed when Kim was left out of the HBO Max revival, and just like that. The feud reportedly stems from Sarah receiving a massive bonus when she was given an executive producer title in season two. When the other girls found out, Kim attempted to negotiate a new salary. Apparently, the other cast members found that out and they thought it was petty and just basically shunned her on set, refusing to sit with her at lunch. According to Kim, she began to face hardships in her personal life and was having a difficult time coping. The feud was surface level and as time went on, things got better from what we can tell. At number 10, Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts seems like a nice person and I'm sure on her off days she's lovely, but on set she's been known to be kind of a handful and has caused some drama with the people that she's worked with. Though she's often cast as nice and endearing characters, there is much more to Julia than meets the eye. Apparently, according to her co-stars and past crew members, she's a nightmare to work with. A specific time when Julia was known to be especially nightmarish was when she starred in the 1991 Spielberg film Hook, a Peter Pan film. While working on the film, Julia earned the nickname Tinker Hell as a play on her character Tinkerbell, combined with the production's perception of the actress. Apparently, during filming, she would show up to set late all the time. She would lock herself in her trailer for hours on end, she would treat people badly, and she would never apologize for her actions or behavior. She caused quite a lot of drama with the people she worked with because she just wouldn't cooperate. At number 9, Bill Murray. Bill Murray already has a bad reputation in Hollywood for his poor on set behavior, so it's no surprise to me to find out that he's had some serious drama with one of his castmates on the set of Charlie's Angels. While filming the movie, Bill Murray was said to have antagonized actress Lucy Liu. When watching the film, you would think that they were all good friends and on good terms, but in reality it was quite the opposite. The film set was sort of a hostile work environment that caused Bill to take on a disliking towards Lucy. Turns out Bill would insult Lucy's talent and acting ability and on one occasion even said quote, I get why you're here, you got talent, but what in the hell are you doing here, you can't act. Apparently the harassment and bullying got so bad at one point that Lucy tried throwing punches at Bill during a scene because his insults got so bad. This antagonizing went on for the entire duration of production and Bill kept on berating Lucy about her presence on set and calling her unprofessional as well. This drama was so unnecessary. Before we continue talking about on set drama, why not take a quick second to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Chevy Chase. Chevy Chase is known for being in National Lampoon and the show Community, but is also known around Hollywood as being kind of a jerk and starting drama with the people that he works with. There are a bunch of articles, books, and interviews of people talking about their experiences with the actor and how mean he can be. There are even stories in the book Live from New York that detail the times that Chase has been mean to staff, writers, interns, and other hosts. Will Ferrell and Bill Murray are among those who have taken a dislike to Chase because of the way he's treated others. Will Ferrell has said that he doesn't like Chevy because of the way he treats some of the female staff members. Bill Murray and Chevy Chase even got into a brawl backstage of SNL back in the day where they said some pretty hurtful things to each other because they were kind of comedy rivals on the show. Chevy just doesn't get along with everyone and he said that it's because fame went to his head, but something tells me that's not the only reason he starts drama. At number 7, Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling is one of Hollywood's most famous actors, but he also is someone who experienced getting fired because of onset drama and it first happened very early on in his career. Back in the 90s, Ryan was part of the Mickey Mouse Club alongside stars like Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, and Britney Spears, but after some onset 
drama, Ryan got fired from Disney. Ryan didn't stick around too long on the show because in an interview from 2008, Ryan opened up about his two years on the Disney Channel where he revealed that things didn't work out well between him and the studio. The La La Land actor revealed that producers from the Disney Channel show thought that Ryan had a bit of an attitude problem and was seen as a bad influence on the other kids. The actor also went on to say that he was apparently considered to be such a menace to the other kids that the mothers of his co-stars went to the executives to complain about his behavior. The studio eventually decided that Ryan wasn't Disney material because of his behavior and he was soon let go. At number 6, Megan Fox. A director kind of counts like a co-star, right? I mean, they work together, so let's just go with it. Megan Fox has been in a few pretty successful films before being cast in the Transformers film, but after the success of this franchise, she was launched into fame. That is until things came crashing down after getting fired from her role and facing a lot of backlash because of it. When she was fired from Transformers, Michael Bay said that the decision came after she was a quote, nightmare to work with. What really happened is Megan made a comment about Michael Bay's behavior on set, commenting on how strict he was. On top of everything, when fellow director Steven Spielberg win of these comments, he advised Bay to fire her and that is exactly what happened. This drama caused Megan to lose her job and also gain a reputation of being hard to work with, which followed her for many years, so this drama really affected her a lot. Her career is slowly coming back to where it was before this drama went down. At number 5, Emma Roberts. Emma Roberts has had quite a few feuds with co-stars. She's had drama with Gabri Sidibe, Ariana Grande, and Evan Peters, but the biggest feud that she's had was with Leah Michelle on the set of Scream Queens. According to sources, Emma Roberts and Lee Michelle had one strong attribute in common, and that was the fact that they were both divas, and so while they were working together, they butt heads with each other quite often. Apparently, their fighting got so bad while working that during filming, actress Jamie Lee Curtis had to step in and mediate the hostile situation between Emma and Leah because she was just so fed up with their constant bickering while they were trying to work. It was also reported that the actresses would constantly have mean girl moments, making rude and catty comments towards each other almost daily. Rumors of this feuding between them were pretty common in entertainment news while Scream Queens was still in production, showing that things never really died down between the two actresses. It seemed like Emma just caused a heck of a lot of drama with a lot of people on set. At number 4, Leah Michelle. Leah Michelle was exposed last year for her Hollywood mean streak and for her terrible on set behavior, as well as the drama that she caused with people on set. This all came out following a tweet from former Glee co-star Samantha Ware, where she let the world know how horrible it was to work with Leah. The actress is now described as quote, callous, rude, mean and even a diva. But following Samantha's exposure of the Broadway star, other people have come forward with their own testimonies regarding Leah and her mean streak. There have been stories of Leah's microaggressions, but also stories of her spitting in craft service food that she doesn't like, refusing to work with people because they don't know her middle name, requesting reshoots because she didn't like her costume, disrespecting other castmates and having crew members apologize on her behalf, and so many other frustrating tidbits that really just showed how rude and entitled she's been known to be. It was never a dull moment on set, but not in a good way. At number 3, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis has been really successful in his career, but it seems as though he's not all that great to be around on set. Though his films are often very well made, it all comes at a price that those who've worked alongside him have had to pay. Apparently, Bruce is a nightmare to work with as he's gone into a number of conflicts with others on set, and they really just hate working with him. In the time before Die Hard launched his film career, Bruce found most of his success after working on the show Moonlighting alongside his co-star Sybil Shepard. In 2005, Shepard dished about her time working with Bruce where she told sources that there came a point where her relationship with Bruce became volatile and they clashed a lot on set. There was reportedly constant bickering between the two of them and it was just a toxic environment. But Sybil isn't the only one to say that they've clashed with Bruce while working together. Filmmaker Kevin Smith has also had troubles working with the actor while filming the 2010 film Cop Out. He told sources that though Bruce was his hero in past productions, that opinion went out the window saying that working with Bruce was almost unbearable. When talking about their time together on set, Kevin said quote, He turned out to be the unhappiest, most bitter, meanest, emo b-word I've ever met at any job I've held down, and mind you, I worked at Domino's Pizza. What an awful experience. End quote. At number 2, Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf has really been going through it in Hollywood. He kind of has a bad reputation now because of the conflicts he's been in, the latest of which got him fired from a movie. Because of his bad attitude and clashes on set, the actor was fired by Olivia Wilde from the upcoming film Don't Worry Darling. It was announced in late fall last year that Harry Styles would be replacing Shia in the film, and now we know that it was due to Shia's alleged bad behavior, as people have cited that Shia is quote, not an easy guy to work with. It was alleged that there was some kind of conflict between 
between him and Olivia Wilde as well. And so because of that and the fact that other cast and crew members didn't like working with him, Shia was let go. Getting fired is always a negative, but in Hollywood, when your work involves relationships with others and having connections, having a bad experience that was enough to get you fired can ultimately burn that bridge and result in you having less and less connections in the industry, therefore having less and less opportunities to find work. Bottom line, starting drama at work is not good. And finally, at number one, Mike Myers. Having things not go your way can certainly cause you to have a bad attitude about things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to take your feelings out on others. When Mike Myers was filming the 2003 live action version of The Cat in the Hat, that is exactly what he did because he was so cheesed that he had to do this movie, he started drama with just about everyone he worked with. After the success of Austin Powers, Mike was set to star in some more comedy films, but before that was all carried out, the actor and the studio got into some debates and there was some legal trouble and it caused some drama. Both sides ended up reaching an agreement and it obligated Mike to star in the Cat in the Hat movie. He never wanted to sign up for that and he really made it known how badly he did not want to be there because according to people who worked with him on set during filming of the Cat in the Hat, Mike was very rude and dismissive and he refused to talk to anyone. He became a hermit and a diva apparently and this whole experience and the subsequent film were all so bad that Dr. Seuss's widow said that she would never allow Hollywood to make another movie based on Seuss's books again. He really wanted everyone to feel the same displeasure he was feeling about the film, but that certainly wasn't fair to the other people who worked so hard to bring it to life. Number 10. Bill Murray Sony's first venture into the world of Charlie's Angels was a massive success, starring Cameron Diaz, Drew Barrymore, and Lucy Liu as the titular Angels. The movie was filled with action, a bit of comedy, and one of the strangest performances ever delivered by Crispin Glover. Seriously, that guy needs some help. One interesting addition to the cast was the inclusion of Ghostbusters alumni Bill Murray as the man behind the mic in charge of the Angels, Bosley. Apparently the set was anything but a comedy after Bill found out that a scene was rewritten without his knowledge. In an interview with the news outlet Deadline, Lucy Liu spoke up about her time on set and the situation surrounding Bill Murray's outburst. Apparently Bill was away for a family event when a scene needed to be reshot for the movie, but instead of using a stand-in, it was decided that the scene could be filmed without Murray's character even being involved, so the scene went on without him. When he returned to find that the change was made while he was gone, he was furious. He reportedly shouted at half of the crew, including Lucy herself. At first she wasn't sure why he was aiming his comments at her, she's not the one who wrote the scene, she wasn't the director or anything, so she asked if Bill was talking to her, which sent him into a full on meltdown. She decided to speak out on Bill's behavior on set, and Bill was ultimately written out of the sequel. Lucy is proud for speaking her mind, despite being a relatively unknown actor at the time, and has always been glad that Bill's career seems to have suffered for it, because Lucy was just the first of many celebrities to comment on his behavior, but we'll save that for another time. Number 9. Dustin Hoffman. Dustin is a very easy man to spot. Not only is he a solid actor, but he has just a very specific face. You know, Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium, anyone? That's an old one. Despite his ability to play lovable and cheerful characters, he actually started out as somewhat of a villain in the world of Hollywood. On the second day of filming his more famous part in Kramer vs. Kramer, Dustin decided to improvise a scene where he strikes Meryl Streep across the face. Let me rephrase that. Dustin Hoffman thought it'd be a great idea to strike Meryl Streep Mamma mia, that's not okay. <laughs> Get it? She was in Mamma Mia. I'm so good at this. Not only was Meryl shocked by the move, but she recalled that Dustin was also trying to use a tactic on her called emotional recall and was literally taunting her about her recently deceased partner John Cazell and his illness. Yay! Number 8. James Franco Tyrese Gibson and James Franco starred opposite each other in a 2005 dramatic piece called Annopolis. The story follows Franco's character wanting to attend the titular Naval Academy and entering into a boxing tournament against some of the Navy's best and brightest. His main opponent is Tyrese Gibson. Throughout the majority of the filming, James and Tyrese would regularly practice their choreography for their final fight of the film. Now, method acting is one thing when you just pretend to be someone else all the time, but it's different when you're literally punching your co-stars for real. Instead of the normal choreography allowing actors to like fake strike each other, Franco was throwing real punches without warning. Gibson tried to be civil at first and asked him to lighten up, but Franco ignored him and continued to just box his heart out. When asked about the incident in interviews, Franco defends himself by saying that he was aware that he made the set difficult all the time and claimed to be so wrapped up in his role that he probably just wasn't as friendly as he could have been. Gibson, however, holds a massive grudge towards Franco, claiming that he'd never stepped foot in the same room as him ever again. 
So good news for Tyrese, James got cancelled and Fast 11 comes out next week. Number 7, Ryan Gosling. The Notebook is considered to be one of the greatest romantic movies ever made in Hollywood, but oddly enough, the on-screen couple did not get along at all during the shoot. They would constantly fight on set and seem to have completely opposite ideas on how several of the scenes should play out. One day in particular was pretty exciting for anyone who wasn't involved, drama watchers sipping their tea, as Ryan called over the director and demanded that Rachel McAdams be replaced by another actress to read her lines with him. In front of 150 crew members, he claimed that Rachel wasn't giving him anything to work with and the two would constantly yell at each other on set. Their toxic on-set feud somehow morphed into a toxic relationship that lasted for two years. Anyone who worked on the set blames them for constant schedule setbacks and creating an overall difficult work environment. Number six, Tom Hardy. Mad Max Fury Road is a forgotten gem in cinema history. It featured little to no CGI, despite having some insane visuals, and it also featured some pretty stellar performances from its cast, including Nicholas Holt, Charlize Theron, and Tom Hardy. But Charlize and Tom played the main characters Furiosa and Max, and while their on-screen characters end up working together in the end, on set, Pretty different vibe. Tom had a bad habit of showing up late all the time. Meanwhile, Charlize was a brand new mother who would be there on time every single day while her kids were forced to be taken care of by someone else. In a book about Mad Max Fury Road, the wild and true story of the creation of the film, the writer Kyle Buchanan shared an instance on set between Charlize and Tom. Everybody was there at 8 a.m. ready to shoot except for Tom Hardy. But to make a point, Charlize took her place and stayed there till Tom showed up three hours hours later. She didn't move a muscle and according to the crew she was beyond furious. When Tom finally showed up she asked him how he could be so disrespectful and said that they should find the sea next Tuesday $100,000 for every minute that he held her up and the crew. She didn't say see you next Tuesday but the word she did say set Tom off. He rushed up to her and pulled out the whole what did you say to me thing? Yeah big tough guy huh? You can't hear so good. Overall Charlize felt very uncomfortable with Tom and had to have an assistant follow her around on set as a buffer between the two. When the shoot wrapped, the tension was gone and things seemed to have gotten better, but the difficult shoot combined with the stress is probably why there was never a Mad Max 2, which really hurts. Seriously, if you made it and you're watching this, make another one. Number 5, Vin Diesel. Dwayne Johnson and Vin Diesel first met on the set of the fifth Fast and Furious movie, Fast Five. They're really, really good with names. This was Vin Diesel's fifth movie while it was Dwayne's first. Not just in the franchise, but in the acting world in general. He had been in small budget movies, but this was a big, big budget movie. At first, everything seemed to be okay with these guys on set. Fast Five made a ton of money and they asked Dwayne to return for six and seven. However, something changed in 2016 when in a now deleted post, Dwayne called one of his fellow Fast Seven co-stars a candied bum bum. He didn't say bum bum, but we can't swear on the internet, so I'm a toddler today. He actually said a word that rhymes with grass. Rumors began to fly that this was more than likely referencing Vin Diesel. Rumors proven only a few weeks after the post was made. Following the premiere of Fate of the Furious, Johnson posted on Instagram thanking all of his fellow co-stars and cast members by name except for Vin Diesel. It was later confirmed by Fast and Furious co-star Michelle Rodriguez that there was a massive amount of tension on set between these guys. They were bros at first, but as time went on and the franchise evolved, so did their egos. They fought constantly over who should get more screen time, who should get more money, who was the real lead of the franchise. You know, toxic masculinity and all that. To keep both actors happy, Johnson was given a spin-off movie in which he co-starred as the lead with Jason Statham, and Vin Diesel was left right where he belongs with his family. Number 4, Janet Hubert. Will Smith got his big break in the acting world thanks to his successful time on the sitcom Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The show followed Will as the titular prince, living with his wealthy family in Bel-Air, surrounded by cousins, uncles, and of course, Aunt Viv. In season one, Aunt Viv was played by a woman named Janet Hubert Witten, but as a lot of people know, she was recasted after an onset feud with Will Smith just went way too far. According to Will, Janet viewed him as an antagonist. She had been in the business for years when Will suddenly popped into her life and took lead of a show. She held a tinge of jealousy towards Will as he just walked into town, got the gig, and that's it, you know? Well, hey Janet, I'm sorry, but that's what happens when you're good at your job. She was trying to convince the producers of his show to give her character more screen time and allow her to breathe on camera, but they said no, because it's not the Aunt Viv show, okay? She fought back hard, but it was ultimately decided that she would be asked to sit out of the rest of the series and was replaced by Daphne Maxwell Reed, who is the real Aunt Viv, okay? We all know and love her. Number three, 
Alyssa Milano. So let's talk about the show Charmed for a second. This was a solid series that was on air for almost 10 years. The series followed three sisters that discover their descendants of a line of good female witches and they're destined to fight against the forces of evil. Yeah, it was a very fun show. However, just because you play sisters on set doesn't mean that you're going to be close in real life. Rose McGowan and Alyssa Milano had a very public altercation that resulted in a little incident on set being shared with the world. Rose claimed that Alyssa threw a fit in front of the crew, yelling about not being paid enough to do the stuff that she was doing. Only she didn't say stuff. She called Alyssa's behavior appalling and claimed that she cried every time the show got renewed for another season because it just meant more time on a toxic set. Alyssa never shared her own comments on the situation, confirming what she was being accused of. Number two, Richard Gere. Richard Gere is one of those actors that doesn't really act. Sometimes people just get hired for films because they have the face for it and the style. For Richard Gere, he did not have enough class and moxie to keep a handle on his role in the film Lords of the Flatbush. He was cast to star alongside Rocky himself, Sylvester Stallone, and according to Sly, these two did not get along. Their beef was strong and long-lasting throughout production, until it finally came to a head when one day Richard was just a little bit too into one scene and grabbed Sylvester aggressively by the collar. When Sly told him to lay off, he laid in instead. The scene was being filmed on Coney Island, and when the actors took a minute to take a break, they tried to break each other. Sly was eating a hot dog alone in his car. Sounds pretty peaceful, right? But suddenly Richard stormed in to join him with half of a chicken dripping in mustard. Despite Sly's warnings about the mustard, it dripped all over his pants. And in true Rocky fashion, he elbowed Richard in the face and threw him out of his car. The altercation resulted in Richard being fired from the project. Oh no, we have to decide between Richard Gere and Sylvester Stallone. I wonder how quick that decision was. Number one, Jared Leto. Now, Jared Leto has always been a problematic figure in the world of Hollywood throughout most of his career. After first gaining notoriety for portraying the character of Lane Dixon alongside Dennis Quaid and Danny Glover, Leto quickly began building up his acting repertoire with roles in iconic movies like Mr. Nobody, Girl Interrupted, and he even took a turn as the clown prince of darkness, The Joker, in 2016, which we we don't like to talk about much. It's, it's not a good memory. Jared has always taken method acting to the extreme, losing and gaining weight rapidly over and over again, and it was in the film as the Joker where we think he might have snapped. While playing this iconic Batman villain, Leto purposefully distanced himself from his fellow actors on set, and reports are that he sent the castmates used adult toys, live animals, and deceased animals as well. At one point during filming, Captain Boomerang actor Jai Courtney found a live snake in his trailer following a long shoot day. The snake wasn't venomous or anything, but I think we can all agree that's a big nope. In recent years, he's claimed that any gifts that he sends to castmates are sent with the intent of joy and excitement and should be received as such. But I don't know, exposing your fellow actors to your body fluids and real snakes? That doesn't sound very exciting. Number 10. Michael Keaton. Growing up, Michael Keaton was my Batman. The first two Tim Burton directed Batman movies are legendary, and I'm never going to look at Danny DeVito and not see the Penguin. Okay, it's just not gonna happen. One thing I actually never knew though was that Michael was once married to his Batman Returns co-star, Michelle Pfeiffer. In fact, Michael actually tried to get Michelle fired from the project after learning that she had been casted as not only a villain, but as his love interest as well. While the split before production was apparently amicable, it was still an uncomfortable situation for Michael to be in romantic scenes with someone that he had well already been romantic with off screen. At the time, Michael was also trying to get back with an ex-girlfriend and felt that Michelle's presence might ruin his chances. Well, as we all know, he was unsuccessful in getting her fired, the project went great, and the movie was great. So the only bad thing that ever happened was DC telling Tim Burton that his Batman 3 ideas were stupid. Hey man, Robin Williams would have made an excellent Riddler, you jerks. Number 9, John Stamos. John Stamos is not just a fun name to say, but is the man to blame for Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen being absent from the Full House revival, Fuller House. A lot of fans of the original series were well aware of why the Olsen twins never returned, but for those of you who don't know, John actually tried to get them fired from the original series when they were still young. And by young, I mean before they were even a full year old. From the very beginning of the sitcom, Stamos complained that Mary-Kate and Ashley were very difficult children to deal with. Apparently, if one wasn't crying and screaming, then the other one was. Oh no, a baby screaming and crying uncontrollably. <laughs> 
Now that is a unique situation. His dislike for the Olsons forced the producers to bring in a new set of twins, and these are John's real complaints that prevented those twins from taking over permanently. Number one, they had red hair. Number two, in his words, they were unattractive babies, and he knew that he made a mistake. That is an awful thing to say about anyone at any age. After realizing that, you know, the Olsons were just kids and that all the other ones were just too ugly to be on TV, that the Olsen twins would be brought back. What's funny is that the studio eventually wanted to fire Ashley Olsen only and keep Mary Kate, but John actually stepped in and blocked that call. It seems that over the years that he turned into something like an uncle for the twins. For any Mary Kate and Ashley fans who are just curious as to where they are, they took a break from acting permanently and have been making waves in the fashion industry. Pretty neat. Number eight, Tom Hanks. Who would have guessed the guy that is basically America's dad would be the cause of a man being fired from one of his film sets? Turner and Hooch was a wonderful buddy cop movie starring a young Tom Hanks and this big beautiful doggo named Beasley. When the film first started its production, Henry Winkler, aka The Fonz, aka Barry Zuckercorn, was the director. As the years have gone by, Henry has always said the same thing about the project. He got along much better with Beasley than he did with Mr. Hanks. The set was plagued with creative differences between the men who would argue constantly on set. Henry's directing style just clashed with Tom performance style time and time again. After only 13 days on set, there was an altercation between Tom and Henry that left Henry out of work and Roger Spottiswood stepped in to take his place. Number seven, Alec Baldwin. In 2013, Alec Baldwin was attached to star in a Broadway production of the show Orphans alongside Transformers alumni Shia LaBeouf. Now from day one of rehearsals, Shia and Baldwin were at each other's throats. Shia's problem was that Alec was never off script. This was something that he considered to be very unprofessional. Shia has since claimed that he was so nervous about the show that he made sure to memorize every single line he had before setting foot on stage on day one. His methods were not reciprocated by Alec, who just kind of showed up with a coffee in one hand and the script in the other one, planning to rehearse in the moment. While well, Shia was furious and he apparently yelled at Alec to learn his lines right then, right there, he said, whoa, he's a lead, what's the deal? Why aren't you better at this? Well, after a couple of weeks and one particularly rough day where Shia blew up at Alec in front of a ton of cast and crew, Alec took five and he had a meeting with the producers. He said that if Shia wasn't let go, that he was going to quit the project. Producers caved and Shia was canned. In the tabloid, they claimed creative differences, but Shia later shared his side, clearly upset with being dropped as if he meant nothing to the show. Number six, Seinfeld cast. Now for this entry, there is no one cast member that could be singled out as the individual who tried to get Heidi Swedberg, aka Susan, fired from the series. In the season 7 finale of Seinfeld, spoiler alert, Jason Alexander's character George Costanza is delivered the news that his wife Susan has suddenly passed away. George is thrilled as he's been wanting to leave Susan for a while now, but it turns out off screen, Jason was just as excited. So were Jerry Seinfeld, Michael Richards, and Julia Louise Dreyfus, who made up the other three main cast members. According to Jason, he found it difficult to play off of Susan, claiming that there just wasn't a lot of chemistry between them. And as I said, this was a feeling that was shared with the entire cast. Julia Louis Dreyfus said that it was impossible to have fun with her and her character, and that the producers were planning to write her off at some point in the near future. Well, the gripes of the cast were heard, and her character passes away from licking the glue on cheap wedding invitation envelopes that George insisted they purchase. It is very fun and it's a great way to get a character written off of a show, but it's just unfortunate for Heidi that the entire cast was like, eh, she's not a vibe. Number five, Jason Momoa. It's no secret that filming Aquaman and its sequel was a bit of a sensitive task. For starters, Amber Heard not only played Jason's love interest in the film, but she was also dealing with the Johnny Depp defamation trial, so a decision had to be made if she was going to continue being involved with DC or if they would just recast her entirely. Well, it turns out that that conundrum was not because of the trial but it was actually just because of her terrible chemistry with Jason Momoa. Amber Heard has always felt jammed into the DC universe, but we could go on about that forever. Ultimately, the studio never went forward with firing Amber, and it was all thanks to the CEO of Tesla and her former lover, Elon Musk. 
Back in 2019, Elon had one of his litigators send the scorched earth letter to Warner Brothers, basically threatening to tear the house down if Amber was left out of the sequel. Warner Brothers caved and moved forward. Imagine being so geeky and so rich that you could tell an entire studio what to do for you. You would make millions of movies just for yourself. Despite keeping her job, Amber has continued to hurl allegations against her co-star Jason Momoa to this day, claiming that he was dressing like Johnny Depp on purpose on set to mess with her. But as I've mentioned in previous news breakdowns on that topic, Jason Momoa always looks like Johnny Depp. It's just, it's just what some people in Hollywood look like. Number four, Sylvester Stallone. Richard Gere is one of those actors that doesn't really act. Sometimes people just get hired for films because they have the face for it or the style. For Richard, he did not have enough class and moxie to keep a handle on his role in the film Lords of the Flatbush. He was casted to star alongside Rocky himself, Sylvester Stallone, and according to Sly, these two did not get along. Their beef was strong and long lasting through the entire production until it finally came to a head when one day Richard was just a little bit too into one scene and grabbed Sylvester aggressively by the collar. When Sly told him to lay off, he laid in instead. Now that scene was being filmed on Coney Island, so when the actors took a minute to take a break, they tried to well, break each other. Sly was eating a hot dog alone in his car. Sounds very peaceful, but suddenly Richard stormed in to join him with like half of a chicken dripping in mustard apparently. Despite Sly's warning about mustard, like this whole thing started because of mustard. It dripped all over his pants, and in true Rocky fashion, he elbowed Richard in the face and threw him out of the car. The altercation resulted in Richard being fired from the project. Oh no, they had to decide between Richard Gere and Sylvester Stallone. I wonder how quick that meeting was. Number three, Ryan Gosling. The Notebook is considered to be one of the greatest romantic movies ever made. Oddly enough though, the on-screen couple never got along during the shoot. They would fight with each other on set all the time and seem to have completely opposite ideas on how basically everything should play out. One day in particular was pretty exciting for anyone who wasn't involved. Ryan called over the director and demanded that Rachel be replaced by another actress to read her lines with him. In front of 150 crew members, he claimed that Rachel just wasn't giving him anything to work with and they would just constantly yell at each other between takes. Eventually, Ryan asked the director privately if it might be possible to restart the project with a new leading lady and needless to say, he was laughed out of the room. As time went on, they finished the project and the two actually dated for almost two years. The Notebook is now a classic and Ryan Gosling is just Ken. Number two, America Ferreira. In the early 2000s, Lindsay Lohan faced a ton of public scandals, but one that's not talked about often enough actually took place behind the scenes of a little show called Ugly Betty. Lohan was a guest star on the show in the third season, playing Kimmy Keegan. Now, Kimmy was supposed to stick around for six total episodes, but that number was actually shrunken down to four. The reason being was that her co-star and the lead of the show, America Ferreira, did not get along with Lindsay Lohan. Of course, According to America and several of the Ugly Betty crew, Lindsay would show up with an entourage of people, usually under the influence of herbs and spices, and the production crew had to repaint her dressing room when she left because it was just so bad in there. One crew member alleged that she would cut images of her own face out of magazines and tabloid articles like she was making a collage or something creepy like that. America claims that one scene took over 30 takes to get right because she flubbed her lines over and over again. Lindsay's team of buddies had have been adamant that America had just too much power and was the sole reason that she was asked to leave the show. Unfortunately, if you do bad things and enough people know about it, hey, karma comes around. And at number one, Lucy Liu. Sony's first foray into the world of Charlie's Angels was a massive success when it released, starring Cameron Diaz, Drew Barrymore, and Lucy Liu as the main angels. The movie was filled with action, a little bit of comedy, and one of the strangest performances ever delivered from Crispin Glover. Seriously, that guy needs help. One interesting addition to the cast was the inclusion of Ghostbusters alumni Bill Murray as the man behind the mic, Mr. Bosley. Apparently the set was anything but a comedy after Bill found out there was a scene rewritten without his knowledge. In an interview with the news outlet Deadline, Lucy Liu spoke up about her time on set and the situation surrounding herself and Bill. Apparently Bill was away for a family event when a scene needed to be reshot for the movie, but instead of using a stand-in, they realized they could just film the scene without Bill Murray in it. So it went on and everything was fine. When he returned to find the change was made while he was gone, he was 
furious. He reportedly shouted at like half of the crew, including Lucy herself. At first, she wasn't sure why he was aiming so many of his comments directly at her. She didn't write the scene, she wasn't the director, but she asked if Bill was talking to her, which sent him into a full blown meltdown. She decided to speak out on Bill's behavior on set, and he was ultimately written out of the sequel. Lucy is proud for speaking her mind, because at the time she was a relatively unknown actor and is glad that Bill's career seems to have suffered for it. Because hey, Lucy was just the first of many people to comment on his behavior, but eh, we'll leave that for another video. Number 10, Nicki Minaj and Mariah Carey. The feud between these two was swift and difficult to hide. In 2012, Mariah and Nicki were co-judges on the singing competition American Idol, and despite functioning on somewhat the same page, things actually went sour very fast. Over a span of just a few short weeks, American Idol became a desolate wasteland of insults, swear words, and a ton of threats. Yeah, things got pretty heated. According to people that worked on set of the show, Mariah was the one making fun of Nikki, saying mean little comments every time they sat next to each other. She was always saying that Nikki couldn't sing and felt that she should not be judging others on their ability. Some other people claim the opposite is the case, but hey, who really knows? I wasn't on the set. What we do know is that things got so heated that Nikki stormed off set one day, threatening to physically harm Mariah as she did. In 2013, they must have had enough of each other as they both decided to quit the show and go their separate ways. Number nine, Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey. So let's get geeky for a second and talk about the movie Batman Forever. This movie was a failure from the moment the studio decided to fight Tim Burton on his vision. They recasted Michael Keaton, shifted the dark undertone, and turned the whole thing into a big live action cartoon. Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones played the villains of the piece, the Riddler and Two Face, respectively. For Tommy, the set was nothing but a pain in the neck. According to Tommy and several of the people on set, himself and Jim would argue with each other constantly. He just hated Jim's improv, his goofy attitude, and his overall energetic performance. Now, he literally called Jim a buffoon following the film's release. Despite working very well together on screen, off screen, they were counting down the hours until production wrapped. Number eight. Freddie Prince Jr. and Kiefer Sutherland. Kiefer is a man known for his roles in movies like Lost Boys or Stand By Me, and he's built himself a nice little nest egg. For a long time, he was starring in crime drama 24. A lot of celebrities made small cameos and recurring roles on that show, but in 2010, Scooby-Doo alumni Freddie Prince Jr., and yes, I know he's been in other stuff, but that's how I know him, was casted as Cole Ortiz. Despite the massive success of the show, the job actually left him scarred and admitting that he hated every second of it. According to Freddie, Kiefer is just an unprofessional dude that he hated working with. Continuing to say that he wasn't talking trash, this was just something that he would happily say to Kiefer's face. Apparently, a ton of his co-stars agreed that he makes filming a living nightmare. Following the end of his character's time on the show, he did slow down in acting, now limiting himself to voiceover and cameo roles. And the odd thing was that while there was some backing up to Freddy's story, there were a lot of people defending Sutherland, claiming the exact opposite things had happened to them. Some say that he's the most professional man in the world and some say that he is someone you gotta watch out for. So I don't know, let's get some hashtags going. Hashtag key for good, bad, see which one wins. Number seven, Chevy Chase and Donald Glover. Chevy Chase became a popular man after being involved with National Lampoon and Saturday Night Live way back in the day, but he returned to the mainstream when he starred as Pierce Hawthorne in Community. I genuinely love this show and Chevy, he just, he, it got better when he left. It would appear that his Community co-stars would agree with that statement. Around the middle of the show, Chevy started to complain about his co-stars, especially Donald Glover. It became apparent that he was just angry with him and was eventually fired for using racial slurs against him. According to Donald himself, aka Troy Barnes, Chevy would often make inappropriate jokes either aimed right at him or just as a general way to disrupt a scene. Joel McHale, who played Jeff Winger, told people that before he was fired, Chevy was complaining about his character's position on the show and how he was being portrayed. Well, the entire cast reminded him that there wasn't anything that actually was keeping him there, which might have been part of what set him off. His character was written out of the show in humiliating fashion, and I'm not going to spoil it for you. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. He feeds some geese for just a bit too long, if you know what I mean. Number six, Wesley Snipes and Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds is known for a lot of things. One of his most iconic roles as an actor is, of course, the Merc with the Mouth, Deadpool himself. However, in 2008, Ryan was a part of a very different Marvel movie. As some might know, the original Marvel movie that started this whole live action comics trend was Blade, starring Wesley Snipes as the titular vampire hunter. By the time the third film of that franchise rolled around, Wesley Snipes was actually just done with working 
working on set. He hated the way the franchise was turning out, and all of his creative suggestions were very quickly shut down. His main problem was the fact that Blade Trinity was written as a straight up comedy movie when the previous entries were more dark and action packed, filled with gore and some pretty stellar fight sequences. So when Van Wilder was casted to be his co-star, he kind of gave up. He famously refused to film several scenes unless he was allowed to keep his shades on. Apparently he was just micro napping during takes because he just didn't care anymore. Ryan Reynolds played a big part in his difficulty enjoying the film. Apparently Reynolds just made it his mission to make Wesley snap. He'd constantly do bits, push things too far, make stuff up on the set. At the end of the day, Blade Trinity ended up burying the franchise and it was one of the most chaotic and toxic film sets probably ever. Number 5. Tom Hardy and Charlize Theron. Mad Max Fury Road is a wonderful film in cinema history. It featured like no CGI despite having some incredible visuals. And it also had some pretty stellar performances from its cast, including Nicholas Holt, Charlize Theron, and Tom Hardy. Charlize and Tom played the main characters, Furiosa and Max. While their on-screen characters end up working together in the end on set, it was just very different. Tom had a bit of a bad habit for showing up late, basically all the time. Meanwhile, Charlize was a brand new mother who would be on time every day while her kids were forced to be taken care of by someone else. In a book called Red Sweat and Chrome, The Wild and True Story of Mad Max, writer Kyle Buchanan shared an instance on set between Charlize and Tom. Everyone was on set, 8am, ready to go, except for Tom. But to make a point, Charlize took her place and stayed there for three hours until Tom finally showed up. She didn't move a muscle, and according to the crew, she was beyond furious. When Tom finally showed up, she asked him how he could be so disrespectful. They said that they should find the CNX Tuesday a hundred thousand dollars for every minute that he held up the crew. She didn't say CNX Tuesday, but the word she did say set Tom off. He rushed up to her and pulled out the whole "What did you just say to me?" thing, because he's a big tough guy and he can't hear well. Overall, Charlize felt pretty threatened by Tom and had to have an assistant follow her around on set as a buffer between the two. And I found out that following the film they actually apologized, mended things up, and Tom realized that he was a bit intense on set, which is to say the least. Number 4, The Rock and Vin Diesel. Dwayne and Vin first met on the set of the 5th Fast and Furious movie. This was Vin Diesel's 5th movie while it was Dwayne's first, not just in a franchise, but in the acting world in general. At first everything was okay with these guys on set, Fast 5 was pretty good, it made a lot of money, and they asked Dwayne to come back for 2 more movies. However, something changed. In 2016, in a now deleted post, he called out one of his fellow Fast 7 co-stars, a candy. He actually said a word that rhymes with grass. Rumors started to fly that he was more than likely referencing Vin Diesel. Rumors that were proven true only a week after that post was made. Following the premiere of Fate of the Furious, Johnson posted to Instagram thanking all of his fellow cast and crew, but he left Vin Diesel out of that thank you. It was later confirmed by Fast and Furious co-star Michelle Rodriguez that there was a massive amount of tension on the set of the film. They were buddies at first, but as time went on and the franchise evolved, so did their egos. They fought constantly over who should receive more screen time, who the real lead of the franchise was, and all that fun toxic masculinity. To keep both actors happy, Johnson was given a spin-off in which he co-starred with Jason Statham, and Vin Diesel was left right where he belongs with his family, probably making Fast 21 right now. Number 3, Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze. Jen and Patrick have starred in a few movies together, most of which were made in the 1980s and are still talked about to this day. Before starring together in the classic 1987 flick Dirty Dancing, they were featured in the film Red Dawn. According to Jennifer, the set was a nightmare for her. While their characters were okay on screen, off screen, Pat was apparently pulling pranks on crew and cast left and right. She said that he was a very alpha individual and acted a lot like a socially unaware jock. She told the director that the things that he was doing just made her uncomfortable and it was just a bit too much. Following Red Dawn, they parted ways for a while but got back together for Dirty Dancing, something that actually almost didn't happen. Jennifer screen tested with Patrick and knew that there was something there but that she just wasn't into the idea of working with this guy one on one. During the audition process, Patrick took Jennifer aside and with tears in his eyes he apologized for his actions, telling her that this film could only work if they were on the same page. According to Jennifer, the moment following their interaction was when he lifted her up into the air for the first time and that was it. Nobody else could have been in this movie. There is actually a sequel to the original film in the works, but no current release date is public. Number 2. 
Rachel McAdams and Ryan Gosling. The Notebook is of course considered to be one of the best romantic movies ever made. Oddly enough, this on-screen couple actually did not get along at all while they were filming. They'd constantly fight on set and had completely different ideas on how most of the scenes should play out. One day in particular was pretty exciting for anyone not involved. Ryan called over the director and demanded that Rachel be replaced by another actress because the way she was reading her lines just didn't work for him. In front of 150 crew members, he was like, Rachel isn't giving me anything, get her out of here. The two would constantly yell on set and that was probably one of the worst days. Their toxic on set feud somehow morphed into a relationship. They were together for like two years and anyone who worked on the set blames them for constant schedule setbacks and just making an overall bad work environment. And at number one, Janet Hubert and Will Smith. Will Smith got his big break in the acting world thanks to the success of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, a show that was fantastic and followed Will as the titular prince living with his family in Bel-Air, surrounded by cousins, uncles, and Aunt Viv. In season one, Aunt Viv was played by a woman named Janet Hubert Witten, but as a lot of people know, she was recasted because an onset feud with Will just went way too far. According to Will, Janet just saw him as a bad guy, you know? She had been in the business for years when Will suddenly popped into her life. She held a lot of jealousy towards him because he just kind of walked into town and got a job, which is what happens when you're good at acting, I guess. She was trying to convince the producers of the show to give her character more screen time and let her breathe, but of course they said no because it's not the Aunt Viv show. She fought back hard, but it was ultimately decided that she would be asked to sit out for the rest of the series and she got replaced by Daphne Maxwell Reed, who is the legendary Aunt Viv that we all know and love. Number 10, Leah Romini. Morning talk shows seem to have a new host popping in and out every season. Shows like The View and The Talk are known for having a revolving door policy when it comes to their hosts. For one reason or another, many hosts have been fired over the years from on-screen altercations to backstage drama. For King of Queens alumni, Leah Romini, she was fired due to an issue stemming from fellow host, Sharon Osbourne. Romini premiered in season one of the show, demonstrating blunt honesty and a certain laid back style of conversation. According to Leah, Sharon Osborne did not like that at all. Not only was Leah fired after the first season, but her fellow co-host, Holly Robinson Pete was also let go for little to no reason. However, Romini posted on her Twitter page calling Sharon out for having too much power on the show, alleging that she knew Sharon had a hand in herself and Holly being let go from the program. Leah claimed that herself and Holly were just too street for Sharon's liking. They weren't funny enough or awkward enough to make good TV. Sharon has denied those allegations to this day and no one has spoken to each other in person since the firing. Number nine, Shanine Doherty. Unfortunately, Unfortunately for Shanine, she gained quite the reputation in Hollywood for being fired due to an issue with her co-star. She may or may not be making another appearance on this list, I guess you'll just have to stick around and find out. For the first entry though, we're looking back to a very popular series, teen drama 90210. The series following the lives of the Walsh family as they move from Minneapolis to Beverly Hills. Doherty played the character Brenda Walsh, with her character eventually befriending several students at Beverly Hills High, including Donna Martin, played by Tori spelling. The series was a hit after its initial season, however, with increased popularity came massive ego boosts. Doherty and Spelling started clashing on set all of the time, adding additional drama to the production team that they really did not need. Considering Tori's father Aaron Spelling was the producer on the show, it's pretty simple to piece together what happened. Doherty claims that she was officially let go for having a haircut that messed up the continuity of the show, but a wig could have fixed that. So, you better believe Tori Spelling told her papa to boot her from the series. Number 8, Lindsay Lohan. In the early 2000s, Lindsay Lohan faced a ton of public scandals, but one that's not talked about often enough actually took place behind the scenes of a TV show called Ugly Betty. Lohan was a guest star on the show in the third season playing Kimmy Keegan. Kimmy was supposed to stick around for six total episodes, but eventually that number was shrunken down to four, the reason being that her co star and the lead of the show, America Ferrera, just did not get along with Lindsay on set. According to America, and actually quite a few of the Ugly Betty crew, Lindsay would show up with an entourage of people and usually under the influence of herbs and spices. And the production crew had to literally repaint her dressing room when she left because it was so messed up. One crew member alleged that she would cut images of
shove her own face out of magazines and tabloid articles like she were making a collage or something. That sounds a little made up, but not out of the realm of possibility. America claims that one scene took over 30 takes to get right because they just kept flubbing their lines. Lindsay's team of buddies have been adamant that America had too much power and was the sole reason that she was asked to leave the show. Unfortunately, if you do bad things and enough people know about it, karma just kind of comes back around. Number seven, Selma Blair. It's funny that this entry involves Charlie Sheen getting a woman fired when he himself has been fired from several projects and for a few reasons. After being fired from Two and a Half Men, Sheen returned to the acting world headlining his own show called Anger Management. It premiered in 2012 with the cast featuring Hellboy alumni Selma Blair, playing his colleague and friend with benefits on the show. However, Sheen's terrible behavior continued to haunt him from his Two and a Half Men days. Blair was very vocal on her problems with Charlie, especially his messy work ethic. Charlie heard about this and he was having none of it. He threatened to quit the show if Blair was going to remain a part of the cast. Sheen got his way and Blair was let go after starring in just 54 episodes. The show didn't last long though, who would have guessed that a messy actor being the lead was a bad idea. The show was ultimately cancelled in 2014. Number 6, Aaron Hayes. The King of Queens was arguably the peak of Kevin James and his comedy. For nine seasons, people tuned in to see Kevin and his on-screen wife, Leah Ramini, deliver entertaining banter and genuinely memorable moments as their chemistry together was electric. Kevin made another move into the world of sitcoms in 2016 when the show Kevin Can't Wait premiered. Another family-style sitcom, only this time Kevin was paired with actress Erin Hayes. While she was not a bad actor in the slightest, it was a special guest appearance from Leah Romini that sealed her fate. She appeared in the season one finale and their chemistry was still so strong. So strong that it was announced that Hayes' character would be written off the show and literally had her character tragically pass away. At the same time, Romini was announced as a new series regular beginning in season two. Though the show cited that firing Aaron was purely a creative choice and in no way was reflected in her abilities as a performer, the firing then sudden hiring of his co-star from the past is just it's a little bit of a coincidence. Just a little, little, little bit. Aaron has never given a reason to believe that the studio was lying and has continued to have a pretty solid career, but luckily for her, season two tanked and the show was ultimately canceled in 2018. Number five, Bruce Willis. Before Bruce quit the acting business for good, he was part of some of the best action films of all time. The Try Hard series, The Fifth Element, and of course, the first two Expendables movies. The Expendables is a stellar action series that sees Hollywood's most legendary leading men come together in one epic show showdown. The first film was written and directed by Rocky himself, Sylvester Stallone, and he called in all of the favors. The cast included Jet Li, Jason Statham, Dolph Lundgren, and so many more, including Bruce Willis. Unfortunately, he was fired from the third film in the franchise following a dispute with Sylvester involving his contract. Before the truth broke, Sylvester tweeted that he had great news, Bruce Willis was out, and Harrison Ford was in for Expendables 3. And a few minutes later, he followed it up by simply writing greedy and lazy, a sure formula for career failure. And it was pretty obvious that something went down behind the scenes and it was rumored that Willis had asked for over a million dollars per day to film the third movie. Despite their off-screen argument and Bruce's recasting, the two were able to reconnect and squash their beef for good. Number four, Stacey Dash. While a ton of firing stories end with allegations, the situation between Lisa Ray McCoy and Stacey Dash is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, McCoy had Dash fired from their show. That's it. During the first season of the VH1 series Single Ladies, the two actresses clashed on basically everything, which led to McCoy taking action. She admitted to having a hand in getting her co-star fired before the start of the second season. In an interview with Vibe, she stated that in Hollywood, she learned to be a boss. She had to say to Stacy, get your mother flipping finger out of my face, which was the final breaking point. For the second season of the show, a replacement was brought in for Miss Dash, who went on to star in some other stuff. 
Number three, Rose McGowan. So let's talk about the show Charmed for a second. It was a solid series that was on air for almost 10 years. The series followed three sisters that discover they are descendants of a line of female witches and are destined to fight against the forces of evil. It was a fun show, however, just because you play sisters on set doesn't mean that you're gonna be close in real life. Rose McGowan and Alyssa Milano had a very public altercation that resulted in a little incident on set being shared with the entire world. Rose claimed that Alyssa threw a fit in front of the crew yelling that they didn't pay her enough to do the things she was doing and only she didn't say the things she was doing, she said a swear word. She called Alyssa's behavior appalling and claimed that she cried every time the show would get renewed for another season because it just meant more time on a toxic set with Alyssa. Alyssa never shared her own comments on the situation, basically confirming what she was being accused of. Number two, Bill Murray. Sony's big first move into the world of Charlie's Angels was actually fantastic. The first round of films starred Cameron Diaz, Drew Barrymore, and Lucy Liu as the titular Angels. They were filled with action, a little bit of comedy, and just one of the strangest performances ever delivered from Crispin Glover. I mean, one of. That dude does a lot of weird stuff. One interesting addition to the cast was the inclusion of Ghostbusters alumni Bill Murray as Bosley, their boss. Apparently the set was anything but a comedy though after Bill found out that a scene was rewritten while he was away. In an interview with the news outlet Deadline, Lucy Liu spoke up about her time on set and the situation with Bill. Apparently Bill was away for a family event when a scene needed to be refilmed. Instead of using a stand-in, it was decided that the scene could be filmed without Murray's character even being involved, so it went on without him. When he returned to find that the changes were made while he was gone, he was furious and just shouted at everyone, including Lucy. At first, she wasn't sure why he was aiming his comments at her. She didn't do anything. She didn't write it, right? She asked if Bill was specifically speaking to her, and apparently that just set him off. She decided to speak out on Bill's behavior on set, and he was ultimately written out of the sequel. Lucy is awesome for speaking her mind, despite being a relatively unknown actor at the time, and so far, she seems pretty glad that Bill's career is suffering for it, because Lucy was just the first of many celebrities to comment on his behavior, but we'll talk about that another time. Number one, Janet Hubert. Will Smith got his big break in the acting world thanks to his time on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The show followed him as the titular prince living with his wealthy family in Bel-Air, surrounded by cousins, uncles, and Aunt Viv. In season one, Aunt Viv was played by a woman named Janet Hubert Witten, but as a lot of people know, in season two, she was recasted after an onset feud with Will went a bit too far. According to Will, Janet just viewed him as an antagonist in her life. She had been in a business for years when suddenly Will Smith popped in. She held this tinge of jealousy towards him because he just kind of came to town, got a job, and boom, that was it. Well, hey, that's what happens when you're good at your job, right? She was trying to convince the producers to give her character more time and allow her to breathe, but they said no, because it's not the Aunt Viv show, it's the Fresh Prince show. She fought back hard, but it was ultimately decided that she was going to be asked to sit out of the rest of the series and be replaced by Daphne Maxwell Reed, who we all know and love as the real Aunt Viv. Number one, we have Jared Leto. Leto is an actor known to be mad. Method. And if you don't know what method acting means, it is a technique or type of acting in which an actor aspires to encourage sincere and emotionally expressive performances by fully inhabiting the role of the character. So basically, aka never breaking character on or off set. Jared Leto stayed completely in character as the Joker and sent his castmates disturbing gifts. And his co-stars had some things to say about it. After he sent Viola Davis a box of bullets, she almost had her pepper spray out. She told E! News, it was a little worrisome, it made you a little bit nervous, and I'm pretty tough. You know, I got into a few fights when I was growing up, but it scared me a little bit. But it doesn't stop there. Viola also said Jared introduced himself to the cast by sending them a dead pig and sent Margot Robbie, who is playing Harley Quinn, a black rat in a box in which Margot kept as a pet. Next on the list, we have Jennifer Aniston. Known as the good girl in Hollywood, Jennifer Aniston seems like she would not hurt a fly. Well, that all changed when Jay Moore, her co-star in 1997's Picture Perfect, said that his most awkward interaction with a female co-star was, quote, being on the set of a movie where the leading woman was unhappy with his presence and made it clear from day one. Although he never named any names, this was the only movie that fit the description. Maybe he's too scared Aniston's legal team will get involved if he speaks up. He also said, I hadn't done many movies, and even though they screen tested some pretty famous guys, I somehow sneaked into the lead 
leading role. The actress said, no way, you've got to be kidding me, loudly, between takes to other actors on set. I would literally go to my mom's house and cry. Next up, we have Bill Murray. Bill has been in the news for a while now for accusations made against him, but this particular accusation is from the year 2000, while Bill was filming Charlie's Angels. His co-star Lucy Liu had some negative things to say about him, telling media outlets that Bill hurled insults at her while rehearsing a scene. While Liu didn't specify what Murray said to her during rehearsal, she confirmed reports that the actor started, quote, hurling insults at me after learning of new scenes rewrites. In the moment, the actress had difficulty processing what was happening. I was like, wow, he seems like he's looking straight at me. I couldn't believe that his comments could be towards me, because what do I have to do with anything majorly important at the time? I say, I'm sorry, are you talking to me? And clearly he was, because then it started to become a one-on-one -on -one communication. From Lou's perspective, some of the language Murray used was, quote, inexcusable and unacceptable. She therefore decided to speak up in spite of the fact that she was one of the lesser known actors on set. I stood up for myself and I do not regret it, she said, because no matter how low on the totem pole you may be or wherever you came from, there's no need to condescend or to put other people down. Next up, we have Miss Jennifer Lopez. Jane Fonda called out her monster-in-law co-star Jennifer Lopez for injuring her on set. On the Drew Barrymore show, she said, the thing that comes to mind right away is that we have a slapping scene. I slap her, she slaps me. Jennifer, as per Jennifer, she had this enormous diamond ring. When she slapped me, it cut open across my eyebrow. And you know, she's never apologized, she concluded. But Jane Fonda isn't the only one who has some things to say about J-Lo. Last year, a viral TikTok trend where people told their J-Lo horror stories went viral. And some of the stories are crazy. One user said, I served at a restaurant where J-Lo and Ben Affleck were eating. At the end of the meal, Ben put a $100 bill down as a tip for the waitress. As Jennifer was just about to leave, she grabbed the $100 bill and replaced it with $5. Yikes. Next up, we have Alyssa Milano. Alyssa Milano has been exposed by her charmed co-star Rose McGowan for being toxic on set. During a Twitter spat with her former charmed co-star, she tweeted, you threw a fit in front of the crew yelling, they don't pay me enough to do this. Appalling behavior on the daily. I cried every time we got renewed because you made that set toxic AF. She also shared an interview clip where she told Nightline, I don't like Alyssa because I think she's a lie. Responding in a statement to E! News, Alyssa Milano said, Hurt people hurt people. Commenting any further does not align with my wellness plan. Next up, we have Gene Kelly. Gene is one of the most famous actors and dancers from the 1950s, and his co-star of Singing in the Rain had some things to say about him. In her 2013 memoir, Unsinkable, Debbie Reynolds wrote that her Singing in the Rain co-star slash director Gene Kelly was a, quote, cruel taskmaster. She said, he came to rehearsals and criticized everything I did and never gave me a word of encouragement. She also alleged that he made unwanted advances towards her during their first kiss scene, writing, the camera closed in, Gene took me tightly in his arms and shoved his tongue down my throat. Ew, what was that, I screeched. Breaking free of his grasp and spitting, I ran around frantic, yelling for some Coca-Cola to cleanse my mouth. It was the early 1950s and I was an innocent kid who had never been French kissed before. I was stunned that this 39-year-old man would do this to me. Jean reportedly once said, I wasn't very nice to Debbie. I'm surprised she still speaks to me. Next up, we have Leah Michelle. The Glee star has been in the news lately for her apparent horrible behavior on set and offset. Replying to a tweet Leah Michelle made about the Black Lives Matter movement, Glee co star Samantha Marie Ware wrote, Remember when you made my first television gig a living hell? Because I'll never forget. I believe you told everybody that if you had the opportunity, you would poo in my wig. Amongst other traumatic microaggressions that made me question a career in Hollywood. Another co-star, Heather Morris, also had some things to say on Twitter. Was she unpleasant to work with? Very much so. For Leah to treat others with the disrespect that she did for as long as she did, I believe she should be called 
out. And finally, Dabby or Snell, who appeared on Glee in 2014, also recounted rude behavior from Leah Michelle on set. He tweeted, Girl, you wouldn't let me sit at the table with the other cast members because I didn't belong there. F U Leah in all caps. Our next celebrity is Jamie Lynn Spears. Britney's little sister seems to have caused some trouble on the set of Nickelodeon's Zoe 101. Alexa Nicholas opened up in 2019 about Jamie Lynn Spears and other Zoe 101 cast members allegedly bullying her on the set of the teen show. Nicholas was notably written off the show after season two. In addition to claims of bullying tactics like exclusion and mocking, Nicholas also revealed in 2022 that she was once lured into a room with Jamie Lynn and her sister Britney Spears under false pretenses, deliberately separated from her mother. Britney Spears reportedly screamed at Nicholas and threatened her future in Hollywood. Nicholas revealed that Britney has apologized since and called her an amazing person, noting the stress eight months pregnant Britney was under at the time and saying that she felt Britney had been manipulated by her sister Jamie Lynn. After Nicholas's interview, Britney publicly apologized apologized writing on Twitter that Jamie Lynn had told her she was being bullied and that my sister was literally like my daughter growing up so I apologize for my ignorance for yelling at you when I obviously had no idea what was really going on. Kiefer Sutherland is the next celebrity on our list and he has some serious allegations made against him. Let's get into it. After joining the show 24, Freddie Prince Jr. was vocal about how much he disliked the show's lead actor and really his entire time on the program. I did 24 and it was terrible. I hated every moment of it, he told ABC News. Kiefer was the most unprofessional dude in the entire world. That's not me talking trash. I'd say it to his face. I think everybody that's worked with him has said that. Prince also took a break from acting after his stint on 24, saying that the experience made him want to, quote, quit the business. Rebel Wilson recently opened up about quote, awful and disgusting advances from a male co-star, though she didn't name who. He called me into a room and pulled down his pants, she revealed, saying the co-star then asked her to perform a very vulnerable act. Afraid of retaliation and wanting to be professional, Wilson stayed on the project, though she said, definitely amongst industry circles, I made sure people knew what happened. She had also separately revealed that a male co-star in a position of power asked me to go into a room with him, all whilst his male friends tried to film the incident on their iPhones and laughed. I repeatedly said no and eventually got out of the room. First off, we have Wendy Williams. When Beyonce was set to release her HBO special, Life Is But A Dream, Wendy Williams was quick to say, quote, I am a Beyonce fan. I'm gonna watch her upcoming documentary because fortunately, one of the TVs in our kitchen has closed captioning, so I'll be able to understand what she says. The audience began laughing nervously before Williams went in for the kill. Quote, you know Beyonce can't talk. She sounds like she has a fifth grade education. This did not go over so well with William's audience who responded with several boos. Excuse me, I just said I was a fan, she said, but we have to call a spade a spade. William's comments did not go over well with the Beyonce fans. It was also picked up by several media outlets who reported on Wendy's commentary. Next up we have Azalea Banks. Azalea has a lot to say about everything and anything except her own music that apparently is not doing too well. In 2016, following Following the release of Beyonce's award-winning album Lemonade, Banks was quick to respond to writer Tennessee Coates' praise of the singer's work. Don't think for a second that Beyonce was intelligent enough to come up with any of those ideas on her own, she tweeted. But there is an update on the Azalea Banks Beyonce drama as just a few days ago, Azalea made another comment about her. Beyonce announced the details of her new album Renaissance Act 2 during a Verizon advertisement during Sunday's Super Bowl. As soon as the advert concluded, Beyonce released the project's first two singles, Texas Hold'em and 16 Carriages, and the banjo twang of the former and the slow pacing of the latter both seemed to confirm ongoing speculation Beyonce was planning on releasing a country album. But now, Azalea has spoken up. 
warning her fellow performer that she was making a big mistake. In an Instagram Stories post, she said about the new material, quote, there's nothing country about it. You're setting yourself up to be ridiculed again. There's a theatrical element to country music. Dumb critics are not just going to accept an ugly blonde wig and bullying from Jay-Z. It's giving big time musical grift. Yikes. She continues by saying, yes, black girls can make country music, but you're just really not hitting the button. Next up, we have Kid Rock. The born free and cowboy rocker threw some serious shade at Beyonce in an interview with Rolling Stone that he is, quote, flabbergasted by the attention that she receives. Beyonce, to me, doesn't have an effing purple rain, but she's the biggest thing on earth, he said. How can you be that big without at least one sweet home Alabama or old time rock and roll? People are always like, Beyonce's so hot, she's got a nice, but, well, I'm into skinny white chicks. Doesn't really effing do much for me. Yikes, Beyonce has not responded to Kid Rock's offensive remarks. However, the Beehive, Beyonce's fan base, has taken action to defend their Grammy award-winning queen. In a way, only the Beehive could, by flooding Kid Rock's Instagram page with bee emojis. Kid Rock then responded by posting a photo of bee repellent. Yikes. Our next Beyonce hating celeb is Donald Trump. Former President of the United States, Donald Trump is not in the good books of many celebrities, Beyonce included. In 2016, when he was running for office, he did not have most celebrity support. And if his 2019 Minneapolis rally speech is anything to go by, he didn't need them, he says. At the rally, Trump sent some words in the direction of Beyonce and Jay-Z, who rallied behind Hillary Clinton in 2016. I didn't need Beyonce and Jay-Z. Trump said, quote by quote. All right, next we have Piers Morgan, the British reporter. When Beyonce released Lemonade in 2016, Azalea Banks was not the only celebrity who wasn't pleased with her. In a Daily Mail article, Morgan criticized Beyonce, referring to her as militant. In a tweet sharing the article, Piers Morgan says, I prefer the old Beyonce, the one who didn't use grieving mothers to shift records and further fill her already massively enriched purse. Morgan also recalls interviewing Beyonce at, at President Barack Obama's inaugural ball in 2008 and meeting a quote, bright, warm, funny, sharp star. A bright, warm, funny, sharp star who pains to be seen as an entertainer and musician and not as a black woman who sings. He remembers the singer when asked if she ever experienced racism in her childhood saying, I feel like with my career, I've now broken barriers. I don't think people think about my race anymore. It's not about color and race and I'm happy that's changed changing. Now it seems to be the complete opposite, Morgan writes. The new Beyonce wants to be seen as a black woman political activist first, entertainer and musician second. He cites her popular music video for Formation, which contained references to Black Lives Matter and her Super Bowl halftime performance, which alluded to the Black Panthers. Morgan questions Beyonce's intentions for showing the grieving mothers of Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin in her video for Lemonade, contending that both women were were exploited, he says, to promote her album. I have huge personal sympathy for both women and there's no doubt that African Americans have been treated appallingly by certain rogue elements within the country's police forces, he writes, but I felt very uneasy watching these women being used in this way to sell Beyonce's album. It smacks of shameless exploitation. Next up we have Rihanna. Rihanna better get to hiding under that umbrella because the rumors of her feud with Queen Bee are pouring down. While the two play nice in front of the cameras, it is very clear that Riri isn't feeling Beyonce at times. Apparently, the work singer wants Jay-Z back, and that is why she sometimes casts shade. Rihanna and Jay-Z have known one another since 2004, when the young singer from Barbados was called into the offices at his company, Def Jam Records. Rihanna has since admitted to being incredibly nervous about meeting him, and told The Guardian in 2007 that she did not get nervous until she was actually face to face with the man who would change her life. As Rihanna put it, I was like, oh God, he's right there. I can't look, I can't look, I cannot look. Before Beyonce married Jay-Z, Rihanna and him were constantly seen in paparazzi photos looking pretty cozy with one another. 
To further fan the hate flame, Rihanna also favorited a tweet once that alluded to the idea that Rihanna was better than Beyonce. Next up we have 50 Cent. 50 Cent has never come out and said the words I hate Beyonce, but during multiple interviews over the years, the rapper has implied he's not the biggest fan of Queen B or even her husband Jay-Z. Speaking to People in 2015, 50 Cent defended the Grammy's decision to award Album of the Year to Beck over Beyonce, saying, quote, Beck produced his record, he wrote the record. There's 11 producers on Beyonce's album. That is a fair analysis and, and not necessarily an insult towards her, but let's dig a little deeper. A year prior, as Beyonce and Jay-Z tried to move on from leaked security footage showing Beyonce's sister, Solange, attacking Jay-Z in an elevator, 50 Cent publicly recalled a time that Beyonce allegedly confronted him inside a Las Vegas nightclub. One time, Beyonce jumped off of a ledge and came running over because she thought me and Jay were having issues, he told radio station Power 105. And I'm like, what the F? Did she really just jump and run up on me like that? She bugged out at me, he says. Next up, we have the controversial Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York City, took issue with Beyonce's 2016 Super Bowl halftime show. During the performance, she debuted her single Formation and paid homage to the Black Panthers, Malcolm X, and the Black Lives Matter movement. Giuliani interpreted her show as an affront to law enforcement. This is football not Hollywood, he told Fox and Friends after the big moment. I thought it was really outrageous that she used it as a platform to attack police officers who are the people who protect her and protect us and keep us alive. Giuliana, Giuliani argued that the Super Bowl is for middle America and that the NFL should be providing quote, decent, wholesome entertainment to that audience rather than political messages. Giuliani's criticism of Beyonce received some really bad reviews of their own, including Included on that list, former Destiny's Child group member Kelly Rowland, who said in an interview with Us Weekly that Giuliani should just shut up. Next up, we have Etta James. Beyonce earned arguably the best reviews of her movie career playing legendary singer Etta James in the 2008 movie Cadillac Records. She even attended the Los Angeles premiere of the movie with Etta James, suggesting the two were on friendly terms, at least professionally, but apparently that was not the case. During a 2009 concert, Etta, who died in 2012 sadly, made it very, very, very clear she was not happy about Beyonce singing her iconic song, At Last, at President Barack Obama's inaugural ball in 2009. She says, I tell you that woman he had singing for him, singing my song, she's gonna get her ASS whipped. A 71 year old James reportedly told a stunned crowd, the great Beyonce, no, I can't stand Beyonce. She had no business being up there singing, singing on a big old president day and gonna be singing my song that I have been singing forever. Lastly, we have actress Sana Lathan, who was accused of flirting with Jay-Z and biting Beyonce in the face. Yes, you heard that right. Comedian Tiffany Haddish told GQ that an unnamed actress was getting too close for comfort to Jay-Z at a party. So Beyonce allegedly intervened, and by intervened, we mean she supposedly said, Jay, come here, this B word, and snatched him. At least that's how Tiffany remembers it. Tiffany said one of Beyonce's friends later told her that this B word just bit Beyonce. Wow. First off, we have the 2024 Grammys. While Jay-Z was accepting his award, he took his mic time to look at his wife Beyonce in the audience and ask the Grammys why they have never given her album of the year. People were stunned and so was Beyonce. Body language expert Judy James told The Mirror that Beyonce tried to hide her facial expressions with her white hat during her husband's acceptance speech. The expert believes that quote, a loyal husband can be a dangerous thing no matter how much they show love plus an intrinsic drive to to defend and protect. Judy shared that most women of today's era would prefer to stand up for themselves. Quote, you can argue Jay-Z has his heart somewhere in the right place in terms of valor, but Beyonce's frozen looking symmetric smile seems to hint that she might just be feeling as mortified as many women would, she 
added. Judy shared, moaning about not getting an award means next year's awards will be poignant for Beyonce. If she fails again, she'll be hurt. But if she wins it, the hint will be that Jay-Z nailed it for her, rather than her own talent. Beyonce holds the record of winning the most Grammys ever, however, she has never received the Album of the Year award. Next up, we have Jay-Z's cheating scandal. In 2013, rumors came out that the rapper had been cheating, and then there was hashtag ElevatorGate that trended when Solange Knowles attacked Jay-Z while sister Beyonce stayed silent. More recently, Jay-Z's album 444 alluded to him being unfaithful. He wrote, Look, I apologize. Often womanized. Took for my child to be born to see through a woman's eyes. The rapper and Beyonce had planned to do a joint album, but but ended up doing solo records instead. We were using our art mostly like a therapy session and we started making music together. And then the music she was making at that time was further along. So her album came out as opposed to the joint album that we were working on. Next up we have the Lance Rivera situation. In 1999, Jay-Z was arrested for, let's just call this putting a knife into somebody, into the young record executive Lance Rivera. Jay-Z believed Rivera distributed bootlegged copies of his then unreleased album, The Life and Times of S. Carter, which was not supposed to hit stores until later. After committing the crime, Jay-Z turned himself into the police, accompanied by his lawyer. A witness to the altercation said Jay-Z walked up to Rivera and said, Lance, you broke my heart. Rivera responded with, what? Before Jay-Z pulled out the knife, according to the witness. Jay-Z pled guilty and faced a three-year sentence of probation. Next, we have the fact that Jay-Z was a substance dealer, we'll call it, in his teenage years. Speaking to Vanity Fair, Jay-Z opened up about his past, admitting that he was dealing substances to make ends meet. It was everywhere. It was inescapable. There wasn't any place you could go for isolation or a break, he said in an interview. You go in the hallway, there are people using in the hallway. You look out in the puddles, on the curbs, everywhere. Jay-Z admitted that while he made a living selling substances, he never once used them. Jay-Z claimed that he did learn some of the business practices he does today from his time dealing the substances. I know about budgets. I was a dealer. To be in a deal, you need to know what you can spend, what you need to re-up. Next up, let's talk about Jay-Z suing Rita Ora for alleging that she still owed four more albums. Famous singer Rita Ora was sued by Jay-Z's album label, Rock Nation, with Ora alleging the company lost interest after they focused their attention on other ventures such as streaming service Tidal and also a sports management company. Rock Nations claimed they sunk millions into Rita's career and that she owes them four more albums. Ora signed with Rock Nation in 2008 while she was an unknown artist and agreed to deliver five albums and has only produced one. Aura's attorney, Howard King, said Jay-Z promised Aura, quote, total freedom from the label. In a statement, King believes that Sony Music made Rock Nation file the action to preserve whatever rights Sony had. Rock Nation alleged it was a breach of contract and they demanded $2 million plus be given back along with unspecified damages for the four undelivered albums. The lawsuit was settled between the two parties with Rita Ora possibly signing with a new music label. Next, let's discuss Jay-Z being arrested for gun possession. In April of 2001, Jay-Z and three other men were arrested outside a Manhattan nightclub and held on charges of illegal gun possession. Police said that Jay-Z was detained when his bodyguard Hamza Hewitt was allegedly found with a firearm in his waistband. Hewitt, Jay-Z, and two other individuals were all charged with third-degree criminal possession. The case was delayed until October 2001 when Jay-Z entered a plea of not guilty and was found not to have been part of the possession, but did face three years probation for his 1999 incident with Rivera, which we just talked about. Jay-Z also went under fire for his decision to host his famous Oscars after party in 2022 at the controversial Chateau Marmont Hotel. Every year, the rapper hosts one of the starriest parties of the night, known as the Gold Party, with attendees in previous years, including Rihanna, Reese Witherspoon, Kanye West, and Kim K. His last party, which was held pre 
pandemic in 2020 was at the Chateau Marmont. But Jay-Z's plans to throw the 2022 event in a lounge space at the Sunset Strip Hotel have been met with criticism due to an ongoing boycott of the property by some of its workers and celebrity guests over alleged racial discrimination at the venue. Kurt Peterson, the boss of Workers Union, Unite Here Local, said in a statement, quote, for Jay-Z to choose the Chateau Marmont for the gold party is shockingly insensitive. They must move their event and choose an after-party hotspot that treats its workers, especially black women, with dignity and respect. Jay-Z has a responsibility to do better, he added. We hope Jay-Z joins Gabrielle Union, Issa Rae, Quinta Brunson, Ashley Nicole Black, and boycotting Chateau Marmont. The union even organized a picket line outside the bash beginning at 8 p.m. the night of the party. In 2020, The Hollywood Reporter published an investigation of allegations against the Chateau Marmont with employees claiming that black and Latino visitors were stopped and questioned when they were arrived more than white guests, claims that were confirmed by a representative for comedian Tiffany Haddish. The Chateau's law firm said at the time that workplace issues are regularly raised, as at any business, and swiftly investigated and addressed, adding that a whistleblower line is in place for employees employees to report issues or concerns directly to outside integrity council. Next, let's discuss 4040, Jay-Z's old nightclub. His nightclub 4040 was reported to have bounced checks. In 2003, reports claimed that two companies filed separate lawsuits against Jay-Z's nightclub for a total of 46,000 US dollars in unpaid bills to the two businesses that complained, claiming that they received rubber checks from 21's Inc. The rapper's company. Ronald Mark Associates was to be paid 18 grand for manufacturing 30 custom tables, but only received 5,000. Ron Berkowitz, a spokesman for 4040, downplayed the allegations, claiming the bouncing checks are a bum rap. Berkowitz said one suit was settled for $8,000 on November 2nd, 2003. The second lawsuit was without merit, but said they were countersuing Ronald Mark Associates after they couldn't deliver tables as promised before for the opening night. The next point is a bit shocking. Jay-Z reportedly S-H-O-T his own brother when Jay-Z was only 12 years old. He said he did it because his brother stole one of his rings. How did he get the firearm? I went to someone's crib, someone's house, and got it, Jay-Z said, explaining how easy it was at the time to acquire a firearm. They were everywhere. You didn't have to go far to get one. They were just everywhere. After doing this to his brother, he believed he was going to jail, but his sibling refused to press charges charges and ended up apologizing to his brother because he was an addict. It was terrible. I was a boy, a child. I was terrified, he said in the interview. Lastly, let's discuss how he reportedly punched a female fan in 1999 at one of his concerts. Yikes. In footage from Jay-Z's concert film, Backstage, a scene from part of the film shows Jay-Z striking a young female fan back in 1999. The rapper appears to slap and then push her in front of him as he walks down a corridor with his entourage. A spokeswoman for the rapper says that the footage was being taken out of context. Speaking to the New York Daily News, she said, quote, the person in that video is someone who he's worked with for years and they are very, very close. And for it to be exerted like that is an insult. Next up, we have Azalea Banks. Azalea has a lot to say about everything and anything, except her own music that apparently is not doing too well. In 2016, following the release of Beyonce's award-winning album, Lemonade, Azalea was quick to respond to writer Tanisi Coates' praise of Beyonce's work. I don't think for a second that Beyonce was intelligent enough to come up with any of those ideas on her own, she tweeted. But there's an update on the Azalea Banks Beyonce drama as just a few weeks ago, Azalea made another comment about her. Beyonce announced details of her new album, Renaissance Act 2, during the Super Bowl. And as soon as the advertisement concluded, Beyonce released the project's first two songs, Texas Hold'em and 16 Carriages. And the banjo twang of the former and the slow pacing of the latter both seem to confirm ongoing speculation that Beyonce was planning on releasing a country album. Now, 
Azalea Banks has spoken up, warning her fellow performer that she was making a huge mistake. In an Instagram Stories post, she said about the new material, quote, nothing country about it. You're setting yourself up to be ridiculed again. There's a theatrical element to country music. The critics are not going to accept an ugly blonde wig and bullying from Jay-Z. It's giving big time musical grift. Yes, black girls can make country music, she continued, but you're just really not hitting the button. Our next point is not about a celebrity, but actually about a movement that's insane. There's a movement going around for the last decade that believes that Beyonce is associated with the Illuminati and is trying to take down America. Beyonce and her husband, Jay-Z, have long been the subject of conspiracy theories and wild fantasies. The idea is that the two are members of the Illuminati and are secretly ushering a revolution, a new world order, and brainwashing the public through their music videos and dance routines. Untangling the complexities of the Illuminati conspiracy would require its own video, but in a nutshell, conspiracy theorists allege that the world is run by an ancient cabal of cultists who communicate through secret signals, sometimes concealed within the music videos. But it's a bit weird that these supposedly all-powerful celebs can't just speak privately or send text messages to, but essentially that is the idea. For several years, Jay-Z has, during his performances, made a hand signal that forms a triangle. This is supposedly meant to represent a diamond and has become synonymous with Jay-Z and his record label. Occasionally though, Beyonce will also flash this hand signal, likely in support of her husband. Thus, conspiracy theorists believe that both Jay-Z and Beyonce are in the Illuminati. Next up, let's discuss Beyonce's fake pregnancy. TMZ alleged that Beyonce's 2011 pregnancy was fake. I know it sounds insane, but in 2011, the internet was buzzing with rumors that Beyonce was not really pregnant and that she's wear and that she was wearing a fake stomach in an elaborate cover-up scheme. A controversial video actually went viral online and that even fueled the fire more. Beyonce appeared on a Australian TV show called Sunday Night wearing a tight red dress that accentuated her baby bump. But when she sits down in her chair, her baby bump appears to collapse inward, leading many to believe that it's not her real stomach after all, but a prosthetic device intended to deceive. But why would she be fake pregnant? There were rumors that she had hired a surrogate mother to carry the kid, so she didn't have to put her body through the strains of being pregnant. Next up, we have Kid Rock. The born free and cowboy singer threw some serious shade at Beyonce in an interview with Rolling Stone, published a few years ago after the release of his new album, First Kiss. He told Rolling Stone he is, quote, flabbergasted by the attention she receives. Beyonce, to me, doesn't have an effing purple rain, but she's the biggest thing on earth, he says. How can you be that big without at least one sweet home Alabama? People are like, Beyonce's hot. She got a nice butt. I'm like, cool. I like skinny white chicks. Doesn't really do much to me. Beyonce has not responded to Kid Rock's very offensive remarks. However, the Beyonce fans have taken action to defend their Grammy Award winning queen in a way only Beyonce fans could by flooding Kid Rock's Instagram page with bee emojis. And then Kid Rock posted a photo of bee repellent. Yikes. Next up, we have Piers Morgan. When Beyonce released Lemonade in 2016, Azalea Banks was not the only celebrity who wasn't pleased with her. In a Daily Mail article, Piers Morgan criticized Beyonce by calling her militant. In a tweet, share in a tweet sharing the article, Morgan said, quote, I prefer the old Beyonce, the one who didn't use grieving mothers to shift records and further fill her already massively enriched purse. Morgan also recalls interviewing Beyonce at President Barack Obama's inaugural ball and meeting a very bright, warm, funny, sharp star that pains to be seen as an entertainer and musician and not as a black woman who sings. He remembers the singer when asked if she ever experienced racism in her childhood, saying, I feel with my career, I've broken barriers. I don't think people think about my race anymore. Now, it seems to be the complete opposite, Piers says. The new Beyonce wants to be seen as a black woman activist first and foremost, and then entertainer and musician second. He, he then questions Beyonce's intentions for showing the grieving mothers of Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin in her video for Lemonade, contending that both women were exploited to promote 
the album. Next up, let's discuss Solange Knowles, Beyonce's sister. In a viral video years and years ago, Solange was seen hitting Beyonce's husband, Jay-Z, in an elevator after he allegedly cheated on Beyonce. Jay-Z's album, 444, alluded to him being unfaithful. He wrote, look, I apologize. I often womanize. Took for my child to be born to see through a woman's eyes. The rapper and Beyonce had planned to do a joint album years ago, but ended up doing solo records instead. We were using our art almost like a therapy session, and we started making music together. And then the music that she was making at the time was further along. So her album came out as opposed to the joint album that we were working on. Next up, we have 50 Cent. 50 Cent has never come out and said the words, I hate Beyonce, but during multiple interviews over the years, the rapper has implied he's not the biggest fan of Queen B or her husband, Jay-Z. Speaking to People in 2015, 50 Cent defended the Grammy's decision to award Album of the Year to Beck over Beyonce's album, saying Beck produced his own record. He wrote it. There's 11 producers on Beyonce's album. That is a fair analysis and not necessarily an insult, but let's take a little deeper. A year prior, as Beyonce and Jay-Z tried to move on from leaked security footage showing Beyonce's sister Solange attacking Jay-Z in an elevator, 50 Cent publicly recalled a time Beyonce allegedly confronted him inside a, inside a Las Vegas nightclub. One time, Beyonce jumped off of a ledge and came running over because she thought me and Jay-Z were having issues, he told a radio station. And I'm like, what the F? Did she really just bump and run up on me like that? She bugged out at me. Next up, we have Etta James. Beyonce earned arguably the best reviews of her entire movie career playing legendary singer Etta James in the 2008 flick Cadillac Records. She even attended the Los Angeles premiere of the movie with Etta James, suggesting that the two were on friendly terms, at least professionally. Apparently, this was not the case. During a 2009 concert, Etta James, who died in 2012, made it very, very clear she was not happy about Beyonce singing her iconic 1961 song, At Last, at President Barack Obama's inaugural ball in 2008. I tell you, that woman he had singing for him, singing my song, she's gonna get her butt whipped, she says. The great Beyonce, I cannot stand her. Etta James said Beyonce has, quote, no business being up there singing, singing on a big old president day, and singing my song that I have been singing forever. Lastly, we have Rihanna, who allegedly has some beef with Queen B. Apparently, the work singer wants Jay-Z back, and that is why she is casting some shade. Rihanna and Jay-Z have known one another since 2004, when the young singer from Barbados was called into the offices at Def Jam Recordings, where Jay-Z worked as the president. Rihanna has since admitted to being incredibly nervous about meeting him, and told The Guardian in 2007 she didn't actually get nervous until she was face to face with the man who would change her life. As she put it, I was like, oh god, he's right there, I can't look, I can't look. Before Beyonce married Jay-Z, Rihanna and him were constantly seen in paparazzi photos looking pretty cozy with each other. To further fan the hate flame, Rihanna also favorited a tweet once that alluded to the idea that she was better than Beyonce. At number 10, we have seven limousines. Starting off strong with her gigantic and expensive entourage to walk three city blocks. Apparently, she was staying at the Metropolitan when she decided to walk to the Dorchester restaurant, which was three blocks away. Instead of having her personalized bodyguards or a small group of people to keep her safe, she insisted she hire seven limos so she could travel the 200 yards from point A to point B without being bothered. Afterwards, she claimed that exercise and working out is something that makes her the happiest in life. Like walking 200 yards with a full entourage is truly exercising. The entire situation is so bizarre and out of touch, you can't help but recognize it as diva behavior. At number nine, we have how she got someone fired for asking for an autograph. A hotel maid asked her for an autograph, which is totally respectful because she's literally Jennifer Lopez. But it was how she responded that made her such a diva. When the maid asked her very politely for an autograph, nothing came of it. But a day later, the maid received a phone call from the cleaning company she was employed with to let her know that Jen complained about it and she was fired from that point on. What makes the situation worse is that the hotel tried to deny it happening to maintain its image. Not only is it shady, 
But the maid risked it all for little reward. Who would think that Jenny from the block would be such a princess about a fan? At number eight, we have the diamond encrusted headphones. It makes sense to have sound canceling headphones with you, especially when you have sensitive ears. But when they're entirely diamond encrusted and worth almost $6,000, it's too much. One of the more infamous moments she wore the headphones was when she was showing up to the World Music Awards on her personal speedboat. And it wasn't just personalized to her, it was completely custom made, with custom love seats that were faux leather and champagne coolers. But because the boat on the water was just too loud, she had the noise canceling headphones. And like I mentioned before, they were entirely diamond encrusted. Like regular headphones just weren't enough. At number seven, we have how she won't respond to her flight attendant. She has her own private jet with her own personal flight attendants, and she wouldn't even make conversation with them. It was in 2012 when she was in hot water for it because one of her flight attendants came forward saying that she was ghosting her. The attendant in question came up to her and a few of her guests and asked if she wanted anything to drink. Jen looked at her, turned her head away from her, and told her personal assistant to tell the attendant that she would like a Diet Coke with a lime. Obviously, this is jaw-dropping behavior for anyone, even if it is on par for Jen. At number six, we have $20 million to be a judge. While she was one of the hosts on American Idol, she was charging $20 million a season. And to add to it, she even bought out Simon Cowell for $12 million so she could replace him. And to prove how much of a diva she really is, her appearance alone rejuvenated the show, so they were willing to cough up the big bucks just to keep her. She wouldn't just judge people on their talent though, she would often judge people on how they smelled. But according to her, at least she didn't judge people on how they looked. Like that's any better. At number five, we have how the construction crew was not allowed to make eye contact with her. It makes sense when one person's staring too aggressively or with weird intentions, but when it's a huge group of people, it's a little excessive, even for human behavior. She'd hired a crew to refurbish her mansion home, and if she was around them, they were not allowed to make eye contact with her, and they weren't allowed to speak to her at all either. But that's not all. A lot of her previous helpers said the same thing, like her drivers and other caretakers. She actually ended up selling that home for $27 million and bought a new one the same year for 40 million. At number four, we have how she wouldn't shoot a commercial where she grew up. We know from her song, Jenny from the Block, that she grew up rough, and she makes it a point to share her story of triumph and overcoming the odds. But when she refused to film in the Bronx, people were taken aback. She makes it a point to seem like she still has strong connections to her roots there, but refuses to film there. It could definitely be for her own safety, but if she was so deeply connected, you would think she'd want to go back. She was actually filming a Fiat commercial and they wanted to tap into that part of her, but she would only film in LA and they required a body double to film the scenes that were in the Bronx. I suppose no matter how deep your roots go, fame overcomes that. At number three, we have her very specific food demands. We know that the diva makes very specific demands and that doesn't stop when it comes to food or drink. When she was touring back in 2010, she required a completely white room with top to bottom furniture and everything all in white. She also required no catering in the actual room aside from the drinks, which included, but were not limited to, room temperature refrigerated Gatorade, Coca-Cola regular and diet, a lemon wedge with smart water specifically, fruit punch, and plain M&Ms. If they weren't plain, she'd freak out. Also, if she was going to receive a piece of apple pie, it had to be a la mode, or else she'd flip her lid as well. As if it wasn't hard enough to keep her happy, any food catering was to be left outside the door by the person bringing it. Another insane food demand of hers is that when she orders breakfast at a hotel, it needs to be piping hot no matter when she arrives or when it arrives to her room. And if it's not, she'll throw a fit. But it's not just a regular order either. It's scrambled eggs, bacon, pancakes, and the rest of the nine yards. At number two, we have her specific relationship requests. 
If you want to be with her, you've got to jump through hoops to prove you're worth the position. When she was still with Alex Rodriguez, she claimed she really loved his physique. But if he ever lost it or let himself go, she wouldn't be able to stay with him because that was a deal breaker and she wouldn't marry him if it wasn't a guarantee that he would remain his shape. And that's not all. She also said that if they were going to be together, he was banned from speaking to any woman under the age of 40 in case he tried to get any ideas. She was 49 at that time, and him having a conversation with someone younger than her made her jealous and uncomfortable. And last but not least at number one, we have how she claims she isn't a diva. You know you've become fully out of touch when you do everything on this list and still claim you aren't a diva. She says she doesn't deserve the title of being a diva because she doesn't feel like she is, which makes next to no sense. But her support for that claim is that she worked very hard to get where she is and that she's still a hardworking person because a hardworking person absolutely can't be a diva with her private jet and her seven limos and her diamond encrusted headphones. Getting somewhere big in life when you come from nothing is a big deal and it's really inspiring to young and upcoming artists. But when you've become that desensitized to your lavish lifestyle, maybe it's time to do some proper soul searching. Number 10, the alleged racism. Jennifer and Ben Affleck tied the knot in a surprise wedding in Las Vegas and decided to have a bigger ceremony not long after. This time around, they opted to celebrate at Ben's 87 acre compound that is just outside of Savannah, Georgia. But this choice in venue sparked criticism that shouldn't be ignored. Called by the family as the big house, Ben purchased the home in 2003 and it features three separate homes within. The Oyster House, the Summer House, and the Greek Revival style home. The listing agent said when talking about the home, every detail is historically accurate, from the plaster moldings to the heart of the pine floors. But it seems that because of being historically accurate in nature, it's left fans wondering. Commenters on social media began criticizing the couple for hosting a celebration at a plantation, which of course is a style of home that has association with some pretty horrible history. To make matters worse, Ben and Jen were aware of the dark history in his ancestral line. News One reported that seven years later, Ben issued an apology after requesting the PBS show Finding Your Roots withheld information about his plantation-owning ancestor. This allegedly even led to PBS shelving the show. This left many fans wondering why the couple would choose this home at all as their wedding venue, as well as why they own it in the first place despite finding his roots and knowing some of his ancestors' dark past. Many found this to highlight some problematic behavior of ignoring the dark history of some of the buildings. Though the house itself isn't true in time, the land is. The property was reportedly owned by a plantation manager and allegedly is an unmarked graveyard. Most assume that Jennifer was aware of this information prior to planning her wedding there, but, and this hasn't left a good taste in many fans' mouths about the couple since. Number nine, talk smack about other actresses. When a reporter from Movie Line turned up at Jennifer Lopez's home to conduct an interview in 1998, he was greeted with what he described as being an orchestrated and deliberate scene. While JLo was being pampered by a number of different staff members doing her business, while she was getting a massage, she seemingly felt the need to let loose during the interview as she started taking swipes at a number of her industry rivals. When she was asked what she thought about the actresses of whom she was competing for roles for, she said the Romeo and Juliet star Claire Claire Danes does the same thing with every character she does. Despite the fact that they work together on the set of Oliver Stone's neo-noir crime thriller, you turn. Lopez then went on to say she was never really a big fan of the two-time Oscar nominee Winona Ryder, and she also went off on Gwyneth Paltrow, who would win Best Actress at the Academy Awards the following year by saying, tell me what she's been in. Jennifer then went on to tell the reporter in the infamous interview, I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I've heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I've ever heard about her work. Hey, my little people. Are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and you know, subscribe to the channel. Number eight, bad acting. You can't deny Jennifer Lopez had some movie hits in the past, but lately fans are torn, questioning if she has just lost the touch. After failing to get a nomination for Best Supporting Actress in the movie Hustlers in 2020, fans took to social media to share their thoughts. The TV host Wendy Williams believed she was completely snubbed, saying, let me tell you something, Jen, you were robbed. They robbed you purposely because they're jealous of you. But some fans just didn't agree, speculating that it was her acting that was a direct result in the zero nominations. 
A fan wrote at the time, she has acted in 36 films but has never won an Oscar. Yeah, that's because they're all bad. They added, no one wants to tell her the truth, Hustlers was a terrible movie, and her acting was very one dimensional. Other fans seem to agree that maybe Jennifer has lost the sparkle that she did once have. On Reddit, when asked, what do you think of Jennifer Lopez, one user wrote, she had promise. Honestly, she has fallen prey to the fame game. She brought solid work for a couple films, but she is no longer a phenomenon or a rare talent. They even went on to add, She can fade with people taking very little notice. Things have a way of working themselves out. Harsh statements for sure, but what do you guys think? Are Jennifer's acting days behind her? Number 7. Insults musicians During another Movie Line interview, Jennifer also offered her opinion on fellow pop star Madonna's career when she claimed Madonna was good at the former, but not so good at the latter by saying, Do I think she's a great performer? Yeah. Do I think she's a great actress? No, acting is what I do, so I'm harder on people when I say, oh, I can do that, I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. However, the queen of pop isn't the only musician Lopez has shaded, as there has been much speculation that JLo's short-lived relationship with Drake in 2016 was nothing but a publicity stunt. However, the fact that Rihanna, who had somewhat of a complicated relationship with the Canadian rapper over the years, unfollowed Lopez on Instagram after she was posted in a pic across the Grammy winner, it seems to suggest that there indeed was some truth to the coupling. Lopez then revealed that she and Drake were working on a song together, but working with JLo doesn't always end well, and Drake learned that the hard way after she dissed Drake during a live show in Las Vegas by telling the audience that he was nothing but a late night call for her. And we all wonder why he won't bring a nice girl home to his mom for once. Number 6. Insensitive Comments Jennifer Lopez was called out for some criticized comments made about her Super Bowl halftime performance in 2020. For the halftime show, JLo came together with Shakira for an iconic event. Despite having six minutes of performance times each, it received a huge amount of praise from the stars. However, after Jen's documentary, Halftime, came out, discussing some of the struggles of the show, a few fans took back their former praise. Not only did Jen brand the whole thing as the worst idea in the world, but she had some very specific views on a political aspect. It seems her organizers just weren't seeing eye to eye with her at the time. During her performance, she was surrounded by children sitting cross-legged inside a glowing cage. Many came to the conclusion that these glowing cages were intended to look like immigrant children being held in cages at the U.S. detention centers. You're probably thinking, how could this be bad, as this is a topic that should be more widely discussed. But it was her comments afterwards that got fans pretty heated. It seems the NFL was more reluctant to include this moment at all, which pushed J.Lo to fight back at the show's organizers in a heated phone call which was shown in her documentary. She said, I'm trying to give you something with substance, not just out here shaking our effing butts and effing belly dancing. She went on to say, I want something real, I want something that's going to make a statement. Not long after the documentary was released, a certain line about belly dancing found its way across Twitter. One Twitter user wrote, In a new documentary, JLo compared belly dancing to just shaking your butt. She said this type of dance and what Shakira offered wasn't culturally relevant enough to be shown on stage. They continued on by saying, This comes after she said she was not happy to share the stage with Shakira. She's bitter, loud, and wrong. Others even accused her of having an ethocentric mindset, where she believes her culture is superior to others. One other social media user wrote, To say that belly dancing, a Middle Eastern culture has no substance, is so ethocentric and perhaps a little racist. Number 5. Drives Co-Stars Crazy Now, there's a list of actresses who have felt like Jennifer Lopez brings things a little too far on set. And one of those peoples on the list is Cameron Diaz, especially after Jennifer went on to diss her about her career to a movie line by labeling Cameron as a lucky model who's been given a lot of opportunities to the point she wishes Cameron would have just done more with her talent. Jennifer's brutal assessment of Cameron's career trajectory reportedly made things a tad awkward for the pair when the actresses were both cast in the 2012 film What to Do When You're Expecting. On set sources would then reveal that the two on set just couldn't get along. Lopez then didn't endear herself to Cameron, who allegedly said the pop star was a nightmare to work with, as she once even said to Jen she should stick with her day job, meaning American Idol and singing, as an insider even claimed that Jennifer demanded to eat at specific times, no matter what, and she would even stop work to have her assistant run her over some small protein in a veg-based meal. This drove Cameron crazy. Details of their feud would soon become a hot topic after it appeared in Star Magazine, after a source claimed to the media outlet that the co-stars actively avoided one another by saying they don't interact much, but when they do, the tension is thick. And Jennifer just acts like 
Cameron doesn't exist. However, when both actresses denied the rift while promoting the movie, it then caused critics to say this was ultimately just all planned. Number four, music theft. From her career in acting to her music career, it seems controversy seemed to follow her. Over the years, Jen has been accused of stealing songs from other prominent artists in order to gain more fame for her music quicker. Back in 2005, JLo released her fourth studio album, which was called Rebirth, though it seems to be received from some pretty mixed reviews. The song Get Right was pretty widely praised, and at the time, it was reported that the singer Usher was furious though, accusing Jen of using his music. He said at the time, I hate it, but I better get some of the publishing rights, or else. I didn't put it on my album because I couldn't get it right. But I didn't expect JLo to just take it. According to Usher, Get It Right was his song with the title Ride, and it was available to listen to, to show proof that it was her that just re-recorded a version of his own song. Not only that, but Jen was also accused of using Ashanti's vocals for her song I'm Real. She said at the time, you should always care about who you give credit to, regardless of what industry you're in. It's really important to give credit. Luckily, in the end, she did get credit, but still, it's not a very good look. Number three makes ridiculous demands. Most big musicians send riders when negotiating with a venue or organization prior to a gig. But if the stories are true, Jennifer Lopez has made some crazy diva demands over the last couple of years. As according to Huffington Post, JLo was all set to perform at the opening of the Indian Premier 2020 Cricket Tournament, which has a TV audience around 60 million people in 2013. But apparently, she lost the gig when IPL bosses found out that she was asking for a private plane. Numerous hotel rooms to accommodate all of her stylists and handlers and the organization was so shocked to even point out they didn't even want to play ball with Jennifer and they would replace her with Pitbull. However, apparently those demands are nothing when you compare them to the impossible requests she made ahead of her medley performance at the World Music Awards in 2010. As the Mirror would report that the singer allegedly requested a helicopter to be on standby as well as a custom fitted speedboat and a pair of diamond encrusted headphones to drown out the sound of the boat motor. And her people have even requested that she had an entire floor of a hotel to herself to ensure she isn't hassled. Privacy was such a main concern, she even once had a piece of beach roped off for her as well. Number two, problems with staff. Jem seems to have been accused of treating her staff honestly pretty terribly. During a storm of fans sharing their uncomfortable moments with Jen, one woman accused the star of being rude to her drivers. The TikTok user revealed that her father once worked for a company that Jen would use to hire and provide drivers for her. The TikToker claimed that Jen does not allow the drivers to look at her and that even if the driver looks through the rear view mirror, they weren't exempt from Jen's scolding. Not only that, but she refused to have her luggage ever touch the ground. Because of her diva temperament, she shared that her father refused to drive for JLo because of all the horror stories that he heard through the grapevine. JLo is no stranger to being called a diva, but not even being able to make eye contact really does seem a little bit extreme. And coming in at number one today, we have two too full of herself. There's confidence and then there's arrogance, and Jennifer Lopez has walked a dangerous tightrope between both categories for years. As the star even once declared in an interview with Movie Line that she herself is an A-list celebrity, when Movie Line then asked her why she was a hot property in Hollywood at the time, she then delivered an incredibly immodest answer by saying, because I'm the best. She said, I feel I can do anything, any kind of role, I'm fearless. This kind of honesty is somewhat refreshing, but having too much belief in yourself and your own abilities will inevitably get under the skin of your colleagues and viewers alike. Lopez then claimed to have something called the stardom glow, but not everyone saw it that way. At the time of her career, even though it was 1998, it was a good year for the star, but she certainly fell out of favor with critics in 2003 when she landed the worst actress title at the Golden Raspberry Awards. And ever since, her career has had a bunch of ups and downs, and it seems like it gets worse whenever the actor lets all the and go to her head. At number 10, we have Jennifer's dismissal of bad teacher actress Cameron Diaz when she made the comment that she believes Cameron is a quote, lucky model who's been given a lot of opportunities and how she wishes she would have done more with them. In turn, Cameron made a statement that Jennifer's behavior on set was rather cold as she pretty much ignored her. She also described Jennifer as being someone who was hard to work with. As a clapback, Cameron further pushed that JLo should stick to her day job of singing. However, in the same Jennifer interview, it wasn't just Cameron that she came for. She also took 
shots at fellow actresses Gwyneth Paltrow and Winona Ryder. For Gwyneth, Jennifer said, Tell me what she's been in? I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. On Winona, Jennifer recalled, I was never a big fan of hers. In Hollywood, she's revered. She gets nominated for Oscars, but I've never heard anyone in the public or among my friends say, Oh, I love her. At number nine, we have radio show host and interviewer Howard Stern, whose reasonings for not liking JLo comes in many forms. For one, he hates her music. Howard's typical musical vibe is 90s rock and grunge rather than early 2000s pop. But not only does Howard not enjoy Jennifer's music, he's also bashed it in the form of jokes on numerous occasions despite his attraction to fairly few pop songs in the past. In summary, it was Howard Stern's show co-host Robin who made claims while they watched her on the floor music video that radio stations were hesitant to play the song since she hadn't been charting for a while. Apparently to further this point, he described that the relevance of JLo being a judge on American Idol kind of forced the song down on consumers' throats. And Howard later accused Jennifer of being self-absorbed because the single debuted on American Idol. Howard further bashed her Super Bowl performance and even ridiculed Jimmy Fallon's praises for it as well. There was also the incident where Howard claims he spent the entirety of his run-in with his friend Mark Anthony, who was married to Jennifer at the time, being completely ignored. This further pushed the established reputation of Jennifer being a snotty diva. Howard's last straw was Jennifer's interview, where she was asked if she found Howard attractive and remained silent while expressing a puking expression. Since since then, Howard has not let up on the insults about her attitude, music, and business choices whenever she's brought up on his show. At number 8, we have Gloria Estefan's shade to Jennifer for her halftime documentary spiel about performing with Shakira for the 2020 Super Bowl. When Gloria admitted she chose not to participate with no regrets, she blasted Jennifer's comments about their experience when she sat down with Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live in June. Quote, Imagine what JLo would have said if I was third. I literally would come out, done, shake your booty, and out. It was their moment. Plus I didn't want to go on a diet in December. This was in light of JLo's reaction to Shakira co-headlining the sports event. Benny Medina said in the film that it was insulting of the Super Bowl to request two Latina artists when one had already historically done the work. Yet Jennifer was the one who was upset about splitting her time on stage, stating that they only had five minutes to sing all their desired songs accurately. Quote, We have to have our singing moments. This is the worst idea in the world to have two people do the Super Bowl. While Jennifer and Shakira communicated about their upcoming performance, Jennifer added, they said 12 minutes. I got a good confirmation that we could have an extra minute or two, so now we're at like 13, 14 minutes. I think Shakira, what we should have is you should have half the time and I should. If it was going to be a double headliner, they should have given us 20 minutes. That's what they should have effing done. At number seven, we have singer Brandy, who was apparently picking sides when the Lopez Carey feud was at its peak. Brandy had shared an Instagram photo of her embracing Mariah in 2017 with a short three word caption of hashtag she knows me. Brandy's followers were on her like water as soon as the post was uploaded, speculating that the caption had everything to do with Mariah's famously memed, I don't know her. In response, Brandy denied there being any drama, rearranging the caption to then say, I swear I don't know what the fuss is about. I love this pic and everyone thinks I'm throwing shade. At who? This is funny. Can't take this one down. I love this picture. And whenever I'm throwing shade, it's not questionable. You know that I am. Brandy also continued unapologetically with, I've met her several times like the several seats that should be taken. She does know me. And if things couldn't get any shadier, Mariah Mariah made sure to clear things up in Brandy's comments with a simple, I sure do. At number six, we have JLo's first husband, Ohani Noah. Despite their marriage being short-lived and ending as of 1998, it seems Ohani still can't stand Miss Jenny from the block. Their nine-month marriage apparently wasn't all that great, as Ohani had been working hard to slander his ex-wife's name on a number of occasions. Back in 2006, Ohani published a tell-all titled The Unknown Truth, a passionate portrait of a serial thriller. JLo halted this project with a lawsuit and claimed that Ohani was breaking their confidentiality agreement. Jennifer won $545,000 in damages, and Ohani was given a court date which forbid him from criticizing, denigrating, casting in a negative light, or otherwise disparaging Jennifer. In the next three years, Ohani threw himself back into news outlets when he made threats to release a sexually suggestive video of Jennifer that was filmed during their honeymoon and resulted in another $10 million lawsuit. In 2016, his appearance on Million Dollar Matchmaker saw Ohani claiming he loaded the blame on Jennifer for their split and how he was looking forward to spending a lifetime with her before she chose her career over him. At number five, we have former NBC World of Dance TV host and mentor Jenna Dewan, who sat on the panel with then executive producer Jennifer. Although the two dancers and celebrities seemed fine during the 2017 reality dance competition tapings, their animosity behind the scenes apparently ran deep. An unnamed outlet source once stated on Jenna's behalf that Jenna, quote, can't stand Jen's over-the-top theatrical face.
bakery. Adding that Jen never fails to ham it up when the cameras are rolling and she hijacks the show. It seems she'd prefer if Jenna just stayed in the background. Every situation, even off camera, is micromanaged by JLo, and Jenna feels very excluded. This alleged feud seemed to be squashed fairly quickly though when Gossip Cop reached out to a show producer and one of Jenna's reps and was informed that their reported beef was misleading. However, given Jennifer's past, can we really be sure of this? At number 4 we have actress Rosie Perez. She and Jennifer apparently had lifelong ties with one another that seemed great on the outside. But both Puerto Rican dancers raised in New York have zero love for each other according to Rosie's 2014 Handbook for an Unpredictable Life Memoir. In it, Rosie discusses working on In Living Color with Jennifer in a wickedly horrible light. Quote, All the girls were coming into my office complaining how she was manipulating wardrobe, makeup, and me all to her advantage. Despite Jennifer dipping from ILC after two seasons, Rosie stuck with her words of Jennifer supposedly keeping the flame of their feud burning for years after they parted. The words on the pages of Rosie's book portrayed Jennifer to be a two-faced person who would crap on Rosie one minute but then act super sweet like nothing happened between them the next. At number 3 we have artist Rihanna who seemed to be unimpressed by Jennifer after the star posted herself chilling with Rihanna's on again off again reported love interest Drake backstage at her 2016 Winter Vegas show. Naturally Jennifer's snap captioned look who rolled up at my show tonight to say hi, hashtag love him, sparked massive dating rumors. And it probably didn't help that Jennifer uploaded a follow up pic of her and Drake bear hugging and looking overly comfortable snuggling up. While many were unconvinced about the headlines, Rihanna was seemingly not here for any of it, which is why she reportedly went on to dub Jennifer as a desperate traitor. According to an unnamed insider who spoke to Touch, Rihanna had felt like she experienced the ultimate betrayal by Jennifer, since they once had a tight knit bond where Rihanna could seek solace in Jennifer for her relationship. Rihanna did not publicly address their rumored issues, however, she did seem to throw some shade when she suddenly hit the unfollow button on JLo's Insta. At number 2 we have Nikki and Jennifer's heated back and forth jabs that started with an exchange during a 2012 American Idol episode, where Nikki performed and Jennifer was a judge. When the female rapper completed her set, she boldly asked, I was hoping maybe I could come back and be a guest judge. JLo, can you scoot over a bit? To which Jennifer immediately quips, I don't know if there's enough room for the both of us. Nikki seemed to hold on to that comment when she attempted to smooth things over back with The Hollywood Reporter, saying, she didn't seem to be having it, but she's gonna have it. We were just joking around. However, in 2015, things were still just as messy. When Jennifer opened the American Music Awards, performing a medley of songs, which included Nikki's hit Anaconda, Nikki seemed to be unimpressed by her performance, as the camera gave away her emotionless expression, which told us everything we needed to know, as one fan hinted. Nikki came to Jennifer's defense at that point, though, when she fired back with a tweet to a fan explaining, I'm looking at my own face on the screen when I'm looking to the right. I turn back and look at her. At number one, we have the iconic I don't know her rivalry that has been carried out for years now. This beef has been ongoing since the early 2000s, with both stars being repeatedly questioned on whether or not they actually like each other. It seems they can't really decide though. Host Danny Cohen brought up their beef on his show in 2014, where Jennifer nonchalantly played the situation off with, I don't have a feud against her at all. I've read things she said about me that were not the greatest, but we don't know each other. I would love to meet her and I would love to be friends with her. However, she told Wendy Williams the exact opposite in 2016 for her show, explaining, She's forgetful, I guess. We've met many times. And he went straight to the source to speak with Mariah that same year, and in response, Mariah reiterated, I don't know her. What am I supposed to say? Jennifer, of course, took this as major shade, and when people were flaming Mariah for her quote, disastrous New Year's Eve performance that winter, Jennifer threw some shade of her own by liking a post referring to Mariah's performance as a train wreck. It seems Mariah got the final laugh though because she made it rain shade in her 2020 memoir, The Meaning of Mariah Carey, where she revealed her feud with Jennifer on top of slamming Jennifer's ex-husband and former CEO of Sony Music, Tommy Mottola, for allegedly attempting to ruin her career with Jennifer's help. Mariah claimed Tommy tried to sabotage the Glitter soundtrack, Firecracker, and pushed that the movie's lead single, Lover, did not go unnoticed by Sony executives. Mariah also added that Sony rushed to make a single for another female entertainer on their label. But rather than naming Jennifer in the allegation in her sampling of Firecracker on I'm Real that same year, Mariah just concluded with her infamous comment, finishing her statement with, after all that ish, Loverboy ended up being the best selling single of 2001 in the United States. Number 10, Mariah Carey. This celebrity feud is legendary, so it's only fair that we start off with this one. JLo and Mariah Carey have been at each other's throats since the early 2000s. In fact, most people remember the iconic line that Mariah told a German reporter, I don't know her. Although it sounds hilarious, Mariah has maintained her negative opinion of JLo all these years. For example, an interviewer once asked her what she thought about Beyonce and Jennifer Lopez and she responded by saying that they don't 
don't even belong in the same category for a very specific reason. Well, it's hard. You can't really put those two people in the same category because one is in a really different generation. They just started singing later. But when you talk about Beyonce, I think she's wonderful. She's great. She's a talented person. But it seemed that she forgot to compliment JLo as well. A few years later, Carrie spoke to Andy Cohen and doubled down on her comments. Quote, I don't know her. What am I supposed to say? It looks like it'll take a miracle for these two iconic performers to ever be on good terms. Number nine, Rihanna. There are several celebrities who can't stand Jennifer Lopez, but one of the biggest critics of the iconic singer is Rihanna. These two former best friends had a serious falling out in 2016 for the oldest reason in the book. They were fighting over the same guy. Before the feud began, Rihanna and JLo were friendly to each other and had no reason for animosity. But trouble started brewing right after Rihanna and Drake broke up. They had had a summer fling that same year, which was pretty casual, but it definitely still counted. Girl code was broken when JLo started getting close with Drake almost immediately after. But the feud really became public when Jennifer posted a photo of her and Drake hanging out backstage at her show in Las Vegas with the caption hashtag love him. In fact, the two were even spotted hugging and fans quickly realized that something very shady was happening. An inside source close to the star said that Riri felt like she had suffered the ultimate betrayal and called Jennifer's behavior desperate. It must have been accurate because in December of 2016, she suddenly unfollowed Lopez on Instagram. Number eight, Gloria Estefan. Cuban American superstar Gloria Estefan was originally supposed to be performing at the 2020 Super Bowl alongside fellow Latina pop stars JLo and Shakira. But after seeing JLo's new documentary called Halftime, where the singer went on a rant about having to share the stage with Shakira, Gloria put her comments on blast. She didn't seem to agree that it was the worst idea ever to have the artist share the stage and explained why Lopez got it wrong on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen. Quote, look, this is the bottom line. You have very little time, like 12 minutes or something, to get things on and off the set. So could you do it with one person? Yes. But I think they wanted to throw a Miami and Latin extravaganza and they tried to pack it in as much as possible. The Grammy Award winner also confirmed that she chose not to participate for a reason, seeing as JLo got so worked up about having two people perform. Quote, okay, and imagine what JLo would have said if I was the third. I literally would come out, Donna, shake your booty and out. But she went on to insist that it was their moment and that she didn't want to go on a diet in December anyway. Number seven, Nick Cannon. The Wild and Out star took a cue from his ex-wife Mariah Carey's famous phrase to throw shade at Jennifer Lopez during his guest appearance on The Wendy Williams Show. While discussing Hollywood crushes during during the Hot Topic segment, the 41-year-old first named Carrie, his ex-wife and mother to their two twins, Moroccan and Monroe. Quote, number one, Mariah, the amazing mother, superstar, singer. He then went on to name Halle Berry and Naomi Campbell as his second and third choices. A producer then suggested JLo as an option and he just responded with, I don't know her. After the audience erupted into laughter, the host added, that was a joke for the lambs. Shout out to the lambs as Kerry refers to her fans as the Lamely. Cannon made it clear who he supports in the ongoing Battle of the Divas, and naturally he sided with Kerry, so we can't really fault him for that. It's been a bit of a running joke for years that Mariah wasn't kidding and didn't actually know JLo personally when she gave that interview, but it was too late to clear the air as the classic I don't know her line has gone down in history as one of the best ways to shade someone. Number six, Rosie Perez. Both Jennifer Lopez and Rosie Perez have served as inspirations to the Latin community for over two decades, but they haven't always gotten along. They met back in 1991 during an open casting call for In Living Color. At the time, Perez was the show's choreographer and Lopez was auditioning to become a member of the dance troupe known as the Fly Girls. Her, her audition was unsuccessful, but Perez saw a star quality in JLo and actually pulled some strings to get her in. But after she was in the group, it became clear that Lopez didn't get along with her fellow dancers. According to Perez, she was labeled as a diva right away. All of the girls were coming into my office and complaining how she was manipulating wardrobe, makeup, and me, all to her advantage. Perez said that at first she didn't believe it, but then JLo screamed at her saying, I know I'm good, I'm better than any of these girls and you know it. 
What's worse is, after JLo left the show and made it big in the music industry, she went on talk shows trashing her former choreographer. Perez also implied that JLo ghosted her. Quote, I called her up, she wouldn't pick up. Frustrated, I left her an irate message on her answering machine. Instead of calling me back and hashing it out like friends do, she went on a major talk show and reiterated my lashing. Number five, Brandy. Brandy has had a public feud with Jennifer Lopez since 2017. And according to Kiwi Report, she made it clear that she supports Mariah Carey going against JLo too. Basically, she posted a photo of herself on Instagram hugging Carey with the hashtag she knows me. The caption was super perfect and a great reference to that famous I don't know her comment. So the whole thing tells us that Brandy is totally teaming with Mariah. Brandy's post exploded on social media and Lopez fans immediately took offense to it. Mariah saw the backlash and chimed into Brandy's photo, commenting with a simple, I sure do. But the singer was quick to defend herself from hate comments and edited the caption shortly after posting it with, quote, oh my God, what happened? I swear to goodness, I don't know what the fuss is about. I love this pic and now everyone thinks I'm throwing shade. At who? This is funny, can't take this one down. I love this picture and whenever I'm throwing shade, it's not questionable, you know that I am. She totally doubled down on dissing Jennifer and siding with Mariah, adding, quote, also, I've met her several times. Like the several seats that should be taken, she does know me. Number four, Nicki Minaj. These two have allegedly been feuding since 2012. It all started when Nicki was performing one particular it all started when Nikki was performing on one particular episode of American Idol at the same time that JLo was sitting on the judge panel. In a rather awkward moment, Nikki asked if she could come back on the show as a guest judge and asked JLo to scoot over. As a Latina artist hit back, she said, I don't know if there's room for both of us. It was one of those joking moments that seemed like there was something else behind it. But nevertheless, the two seemed to be just joking around. Even though Nikki told a reporter backstage, Quote, she didn't seem to be having it, but she's gonna have it. Okay, so now we're jumping to 2015, when fans swear that Nicki shaded JLo for performing her song at the American Music Awards. As she was performing a small part of Anaconda, the camera cut to Nicki in the audience, looking less than happy with the rendition. The clip showed her emotionless face and made it seem like she didn't approve of the way her song was being used. Number three, Ryan Seacrest. This incident gives Ryan every reason to hate JLo because it's pretty bad. Ryan Seacrest worked alongside the singer on American Idol and the two quickly became friends. But all that seemingly changed when the talk show host revealed that he flew down to Miami to celebrate her milestone 50th birthday, only to be denied entry at the door. Ouch. He recalled the whole story on Live with Kelly and Ryan and explained that he flew down from New York for only a few hours because he had to make it back in time for the next morning show. But when he finally arrived, the doorman told him, you're not on the list, to which she responded, clearly there's a mistake. She invited me personally. But upon being denied, he checked the list and couldn't find his name. The doorman just asked him to wait, made a quick call and was able to confirm that Seacrest was indeed on the guest list. But the host went on to say that he was the first person there and no one really got turned up until after he left. It would have certainly been a little embarrassing to say in the least. Number two, Cameron Diaz. Throughout the years, Jennifer Lopez has been known to speak negatively about her fellow actors. And it looks like it may have come back to bite her. During an interview in the late 90s, JLo explained that Cameron Diaz was just a lucky model who was given opportunities. She did mention that Diaz can be good when directed, but Lopez's past comments about Cameron's career allegedly made things super awkward between them when they were when they both had to buckle down and work together in the 2012 comedy, What to Expect When You're Expecting. Several anonymous sources on the set of the film claimed that the two stars did not get along at all during the shoot. In fact, it was reported that Cameron said the singer was a nightmare to work with. Quote, she even said that Jen should stick to her day job, meeting American Idol and singing. According to the insider, JLo demanded to eat at specific times, no matter what, and stops working when it suits her. And she had her 
assistant run over to her with food. This is what allegedly drove Cameron crazy. Another source claimed that the co-stars actively avoided one another while filming and tensions were thick. Number 1. Ojani Noah The former couple were married on February 22nd, 1997 and got divorced barely one year later, in January of 1998. It was so long ago that you would think Ojani has moved on from the relationship, but apparently he's still holding on to a bit of resentment. In fact, Jennifer's former flame was out to make a buck off their brief marriage by trying to expose revealing videos from their honeymoon. Ojani was even hauled into court after he started planning a tell-all movie based on the revealing home footage called How I Married Jennifer Lopez, The JLo and Ojani Noah Story. The result? Well, she sued him for a whopping $10 million and demanded a permanent court order, blocking her ex from making any videos public. Ojani also threatened to write a tell-all book unless he was paid $5 million by the singer. His unpublished book alleges that JLo had multiple affairs, including one with Mark Anthony, during the 11 months that they were married. But a judge was not having it and awarded her $545,000 in damages and quashed the book, ruling that it violated a 2004 deal not to publish details of their relationship. Her team calls the movie an outrageous attempt to make money and received substantial compensation. So it's clear that he's still a little bit bitter. Number 10, Portia de Rossi. In her 2010 groundbreaking memoir, Unbearable Lightness, Portia de Rossi reveals the pain and illness that haunted her for decades, from a time she was a 12-year-old girl working as a model in Australia through her early rise to fame as a cast member of the hit television show Ally McBeal. She also detailed her struggles with and while living in the public eye and recounted how she survived on 300 calories a day and took 20 laxatives daily trying to maintain a weight of 82 pounds. According to her memoir, Portia both starved herself and putting her life in danger and concealing from herself and everyone around her the seriousness of her illness, and described the elaborate rituals around food that came to dominate hours of every day. The actress did this all while terrified that the truth of her sexuality would be exposed in the tabloids, and revealed the heartache and fear that comes from living a life in the closet, which was only magnified by her unrelenting desire to be thinner, more in control of her body, and the number of calories she consumed and spent. But it it wasn't all bad, Portia also recounted how falling in love with Ellen DeGeneres helped her develop a healthy body image, embrace her sexual orientation, and gain inner peace. Number 9. Janice Dickinson A strange encounter with Bill Cosby in 1982 was described in the 2002 memoir No Lifeguard on Duty by the self-anointed world's first supermodel Janice Dickinson. In her book, she reveals real moments that she experienced with Cosby and goes into great detail when it comes to taking back the narrative. Janice mentioned how Cosby allegedly answered his hotel room door in nothing but a towel and kissed her. He then took her to dinner and suggested that she follow him back upstairs. The memoir was pretty explosive at the time and would come back into relevance in 2018 when she chose to testify in court to Cosby's crimes. The comedian was once known to millions as America's dad, famous for his clean brand of family comedy and his award-winning work with children's programming. So Janice's memoir really did help expose Cosby's life, as eventually more than 50 women came out, claiming that the star slipped them illicit substances and took advantage of them while they were unconscious. And in April of 2018, an 80-year-old Cosby was sentenced to 3 to 10 years in prison, although he would eventually be released in 2021. Number 8. Corey Feldman In his deeply personal 2013 memoir, child star and teen heartthrob Corey Feldman exposes the darkness that loomed behind his rise to fame. Although he undoubtedly had a successful career, famous friendships, and high-profile relationships, Corey reveals a side to his star-studded life that no one knew about, and it's full of tragedy. He came from a broken family that he emancipated himself from at the age of 15. As a teenager, he suffered physical, emotional, and sexual violence. The Stand By Me star was also arrested and struggled with addiction throughout his time as a successful working actor. But most shockingly, Corey also implied that his close friend Corey Haim's lifelong battle 
battle with addiction was the result of being preyed upon by a powerful older man. Following the book's publication came rampant speculations about the identity of the offender, and it's something that readers still argue about to this day. His memoir, Choreography, weaves a heartbreaking story of pain and survival that reveals just how dark the industry can really be. Number 7. Holly Madison Former Playboy Bunny and Girls Next Door star Holly Madison dished on how oppressive life with Hugh Hefner really was in 2015's Down the Rabbit Hole. Madison described the many bizarre rules and rituals that Hefner imposed upon his girlfriends. For instance, that they needed to wear matching flannel pajamas, engage in a group dressed in tiny skirts and bralettes and had a daily curfew of 9pm. The memoir tells the story of Madison's time with Hefner from 2001 to 2008 and its aftermath. She goes into great detail about the reality of her life behind the cameras, how her depression in the Playboy Mansion reached harrowing depths, yet she felt trapped there. She also opened up about her unwillingness to admit to anyone how sad she really was, and Hefner's emotional control over her. The book also explores her time on the reality show The Girls Next Door and the weirdness that was pop culture in the early 2000s. When speaking about her book, Holly said, quote, I felt like I had something to say about being in the midst of that whole thing Thing that was going on with Paris Hilton and Jessica Simpson and Kendra was so celebrated and I was a part of it too for being dumb on TV. Part of the reason I wanted to write the book was to show the other side of it, which goes to show you just how much of it was all for the cameras. Number 6. Shania Twain The Grammy winning country singer confronted her childhood demons when she wrote her 2011 memoir From This Moment On, describing how her stepfather Jerry was physically, sexually and verbally violent towards her and her mother Sharon. In a frank and often shocking autobiography, the singer reveals graphic and personal details about her rags to riches story and the price of ambition and success. Throughout her memoir, it also became clear that Shania experienced a harrowing degree of poverty and hunger. For instance, she claimed that sometimes there was only bread and mustard for her and her four siblings to eat, and they often wore plastic bread bags to cover their shoes to protect their feet during winter, and regularly went to school without lunch. The singer also had to deal with a double betrayal in her life. She wrote about the heartache that she went through when she found out about the affair between her husband of 14 years, Robert Lang, and her best friend. As a result, Shania became so distraught that she literally lost her voice to spasmodic dysphonia, which left her unable to sing. So her memoir explores how she worked through all that heartbreak. Number 5. Sharon Stone She became a Hollywood icon and a household name after her role in Basic Instinct, and in a 2021 memoir, the Beauty of Living Twice, she finally reveals the vulnerability behind her femme fatale persona. She goes into great detail about her experiences in Hollywood, like how she was tricked into that famous shot in Basic Instinct and ill-equipped for fame when it finally came to her. She was also routinely taken advantage of in the male-dominated film industry. She claims that the filmmakers were not entirely honest about what they captured with the camera, and so they didn't have her complete consent to put that scene in the film. Quote, I do think we have to create a think tank that really addresses what is a crime, what is a felony, what is consent. The name of her memoir actually comes from a life-changing brain hemorrhage that she suffered in 2001 that almost killed her. It left her without the basic ability to function and she ended up losing her family, her career and a huge part of her life, which she had to start again from the ground up. Stone also talks about how she went through a childhood of and violence to a career in an industry that actually brought back a lot of those memories for her. Although in Hollywood, it was all hidden under the cover of money and glamour. Number 4. Leah Remini A former longtime Scientologist, King of Queens star Leah Remini opened up about her experiences in the church in her 2015 memoir, Troublemaker. As a teenager in the church's C organization, Remini said that she was reprimanded for studying by the pool at the Scientology-run Sand Castle Hotel in Florida, and as a pun punishment was taken out to sea on a boat, thrown overboard, and nearly drowned by a group leader. Not only that, but she was also once fined $40,000 after confessing to stealing food from the headquarters 20 years earlier. In her memoir, Leah also made some shocking allegations about several well-known Hollywood celebrities. In fact, she recalled a time that her and her husband, Angelo, spent time at Tom Cruise's Beverly Hills mansion when he invited a group of well-known Scientologists 
and other celebrities, including the Smiths. She actually called Will and Jada Pinkett Smith famous friends of the church, and even mentioned the Scientology school that they opened, revealing that despite Jada's denial, she is indeed good friends with Tom Cruise and an active member of the controversial religion. Number three, Jeanette McCurdy. Described as both heartbreaking and hilarious, iCarly star Jeanette McCurdy's bluntly titled memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, gives fans a glimpse into what really went on behind the cameras, something that up until now fans have only been able to speculate about. Jeanette exposes her traumatic experiences on Nickelodeon and the disturbing truth about how she was mistreated by her mother, who pushed her to be a child star, noting that the persona she was known for throughout her youth and her young adult life was a front forced upon her by her mom, who, in addition to everything else, was extremely physically inappropriate with both her and her brother, even when they were teenagers. Jeanette also discusses the perils of young fame and reveals that she developed anorexia as a child and talks about why she ultimately quit acting altogether. She also details numerous instances where she felt exploited as a teen actor, both on and off set. The actress refers to the person behind the demands as simply the creator throughout the memoir, never naming them. She simply describes them as mean-spirited, controlling, and terrifying, calling a time when she was filming an episode of iCarly that he insisted that she wear a bikini instead of a one-piece swimsuit which she preferred. The revelations in her new book are absolutely shocking, and they really expose the traumatic experience of being a child star. Number two, Christina Crawford. At the height of her fame in the 1940s, Joan Crawford had a considerable reputation to uphold. She won a 1945 Best Actress Academy Award for the lead role in Mildred Pierce. She lived in a beautiful house in Brentwood, LA, and used her wealth to adopt and raise four children, including Christina Crawford. For all of this, Joan was celebrated in the public eye and had extensive magazine spreads about her happy family life. But to her daughter, the facade was a complete lie, and eventually her frustration at the discrepancy between her mother's private existence and her public reputation bubbled over. In 1978, she published Mummy Dearest, which told the truth about her mother's character, that she was a sadistic perfectionist. It was the first tell-all celebrity memoir to talk so openly about childhood and subsequently was a worldwide sensation upon its release. In fact, it stayed at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for 42 weeks and even resulted in the 1981 film adaptation starring Faye Dunway that would go on to become a cult hit. To this day, most people associate Joan Crawford with that infamous scene where she launches into a vicious tirade after discovering Christina's dresses were hung up on wire clothes hangers. So it's safe to say that her reputation never recovered. And coming in at number one, Rose McGowan. In her 2018 memoir, Brave, the outspoken actress takes readers behind the scenes of her life in Hollywood, where she has become known as one of the fiercest and realest women fighting to expose the ugly truth about Harvey Weinstein and the systematic misogyny that has defined the industry for so long. The most outspoken of all of Weinstein's accusers, McGowan opens up about when she first met the movie mogul at the Sundance Film Festival, but only refers to him in her book as the monster. She was at the premiere of her 1997 film, Going All The Way, when he sat behind her. The next day, she was sent to his hotel room, where the two talked about films and her acting goals. But as he walked her out, McGowan writes that he pushed her into his bathroom, forcibly backed her into the wall, and ripped off her clothes. But most shockingly, after the incident, the actress was driven to a photo op with her Phantoms co-star Ben Affleck. When she told him what happened, he simply said, Damn it, I told him to stop doing that. Her memoir couldn't be more relevant to current events, as to date, 84 women have come forward with allegations against Weinstein, and he is currently serving a prison sentence of 23 years. Hollywood seems all glitz and glamour, but quite a few celebrities have referenced the underlying darkness that occurs behind the scenes. Jim Carrey, one of the biggest and highest paid actors of our time, has shared his thoughts on Hollywood since retiring from the spotlight. After the Chris Rock Will Smith Oscars Slap incident. Carrie shared his opinions on the standing ovation Will Smith received when winning an Oscar later that night. Hollywood is just 
spineless, and it really felt like it was a clear indication that we aren't the cool club anymore. Carrie went on to say that Smith should have been escorted from the Dolby Theater after slapping Rock for making an insensitive joke about his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. In March 2022, Carrie announced to Access Hollywood that he was probably retiring from acting. Well, I'm retiring. Yeah, probably. I'm being fairly serious, he shared. It depends. If the angels bring some sort of script that's written in gold ink that says to me that it's going to be really important for people to see, I might continue down the road, but I'm taking a break. Carrie added, I feel like, and this is something you might never hear another celebrity say as long as time exists, I have enough. I've done enough. I am enough. Our second celebrity is Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato starred in many Disney Channel movies and shows like Camp Rock, Princess Protection Program, and Sunny with a Chance. But on a podcast, Lovato shares she, as well as many of her co-stars, were subjected to harsh treatment and multiple strict rules and regulations while working for the company. She said, you can't be seen at a party with a red cup in your hand because it looks like you're drinking. There was this website called Ocean Up that would take all scandalous things that were happening to Disney actors and put it on there. So we lived in fear of that website. I didn't have food in my hotel room. They wouldn't let me eat the snacks in the mini bar. Then my security walked by my room and was made aware that they had barricaded me into my hotel room. They put furniture outside my door so that I couldn't get out and sneak out and eat if I wanted to. It was that level of controlling when it came to my food, which just made my eating troubles worse. She also stated that she felt that she was practically taking care of her own family. At a certain point, I was paying for the roof over my whole family's head and my dad had quit his job to become my manager so his income was coming right from me. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and there was just that pressure of I'm paying for everything and like I need to keep going because if things start to disappear so does the finances. Our next celeb on the list is Isla Fisher. The actress nearly drowned while filming a scene in Now You See Me. Fisher discussed what went wrong with the stunt and it is horrifying. I was in a tank of water. My character is submerged in a tank and piranhas are dropped on her head, she says. And whilst we were there, we shot it over three and a half days. Even though I had a quick release magnetic thing on my handcuffs, the chain that went between my ankles and my wrists was not able to be broken. And it got stuck underneath the slat and I was trapped. The actor also discussed the kill switch in the tank. There was a quick release switch that could have emptied the tank of water in 70 seconds. However, as a result of being tangled, Fisher was unable to reach for the switch. I was very scared and I was banging and saying, set me free. But everybody just thought I was doing fabulous acting. They thought I was being Meryl Streep in that tank. Actually, I was drowning. I guess Hollywood really wanted that good take. Our next celebrity is model Miranda V. The modeling world seems harmless, but darkness looms. Miranda accused Gigi and Bella Hadid's father of inappropriate physical behavior in a lengthy Instagram post in February 2018. Thank you, Kate Upton. It is time people like at Paul Marciano and Mohammed Hadid get exposed for who they really are. I met with Paul at his guest headquarters. That's actually an apartment. I thought it was a professional meeting, but it was just me, him, and Champagne, where he inappropriately touched me in an apartment, all to get a test shoot for guests. Former Disney Child star Allison Stoner exposes Hollywood with her new podcast and some of the claims are alarming. Allison said, I lost the ability to relate to non-famous experiences after the age of eight. Imagine on your eighth birthday, you could never walk outside again without being stopped, asked for photos, or followed, unless you wore a disguise or brought security with you. Allison also mentioned the horror when they had to kiss both Dylan Sprouse and Cole Sprouse for an episode of The Sweet Life. The experience left them with conflicted feelings. Your character may have some arc or transformation that isn't evident upon reading the script of the first episode, Stoner explained. So writers and executives might decide to make your character do anything on the next episode and it's assumed that you're gonna agree to whatever is scripted. My first kiss and several of the times I experienced kissing all happened on camera, on camera. Was I ready for that? 
No, I felt young and uncomfortable, Stoner said, but they were already under contract and didn't want to appear difficult. Another celeb that has exposed Hollywood is Selena Gomez, the superstar who boasts 430 million followers on Instagram, often speaks about the downside of being famous, telling Interview Magazine in 2020 that everything she does causes a reaction, saying, The sad part is, I don't remember a time when that wasn't the case. What has kept me afloat is that I know eventually it'll be somebody else, and I don't mean that in a negative way. She said, adding that fame has still allowed her to talk about things that are important to her. A huge part of why I have a platform is to help people. That's why I think I'm okay with the magnitude. I mean, I'm not really okay with it, but I'm gonna say that I am because it's worth it. Perhaps the celebrity with the most famous Hollywood horror story is Miss Brittany Spears. In 2008, Jamie Spears, her dad, was granted the conservatorship after Brittany reportedly struggled with mental health issues and was hospitalized. After after Britney was released, a Los Angeles court made the conservatorship permanent, giving her father power over all her finances and her medical decisions. Although Britney was an adult at the time, she was treated like a prisoner and says she was not allowed to leave her house unless granted permission. Her father was making more money than her because he was taking a huge percentage of her earnings and not telling her. Wow, what a father he is. The greed of Hollywood doesn't stop there though. Scientology, a popular organization in Hollywood, has been known to take insane amounts of money from its members, claiming the payments will get them into a higher level in the afterlife. Actress Leah Remini, a former Scientologist, exposes the organization for the way they ruined her life after she left. The actress, who was brought into the church as an eight-year-old after her mother converted to the religion, slammed the organization for its alleged scare tactics and seemingly helping certain members avoid avoid jail for various horrible crimes. Leah met famous Scientologist slash actor Tom Cruise while still in the organization, but had to pay $1 million to do so which she paid. After leaving, Leah sued the organization for alleged stalking and hacking. She states she reportedly had cars chasing her and following her every single day and had hackers hack into her bank account and steal thousands of dollars all because she left the organization. Yikes. Not all Hollywood drama comes from Hollywood though. And this was the case for Kim Kardashian in Paris. In October 2016, while on a work trip to Paris, Kardashian was robbed at 3 a.m. while alone in her hotel. She was tied up and blindfolded while men in masks raided the hotel room for money. In the end, $10 million worth of jewelry was stolen as well as two cell phones. Kim's sisters and bodyguards were at the club while everything took place and Kim decided to stay home because she was tired. Boy, Boy, was that a life-changing mistake. Kim recalled the fear that she felt during a conversation with the concierge, who was also held hostage in that moment. She says to the concierge, I'm like, what is happening? Are we gonna die? Just tell them I have children. I have babies, I have a husband, I have a family. Like, I have to get home. Tell them, take anything you want. Two French judges later charged 12 people in relation to that robbery. Kardashian, who shares four kids with ex Kanye West, has said that she almost lost herself in the year following the crime. Explaining on the Alec Baldwin show in 2018, I was never depressed, but I wasn't motivated to get up and work like I used to. It shook me. However, the reality star also shared that she has learned to feel grateful for the experience in a way. There was a lot of me that measured who I was by how much I had. I thought, oh, I'm worth so much, she noted. That needed to change in me. Our final celebrity of the day is Miley Cyrus. Although Hannah Montana was a family-friendly show, starring in it gave Miley an identity crisis, she says. I had gone from being a character almost as often as I was myself. And actually, the concept of the show is that when you're this character, when you have this alter ego, you're valuable. You've got millions of fans, you're the biggest star in the world. And then the concept was that when I looked like myself, when I didn't have the wig on anymore, nobody cared about me. I 
wasn't a star anymore. So that was drilled into my head, Cyrus explained. I really had to break that, and I think that's maybe why I almost created a characterized version of myself at times, in the way of being aware of how other people see me. I never created a character where it wasn't me, but I was aware of how people saw me, and I maybe played into it a little bit, Cyrus continued. Speaking of her persona after, Cyrus has also talked about how the costumes and makeup took their toll on her, likely causing some body dysmorphia. I'm this fragile little girl playing a 16 year old in a wig and a ton of makeup. It was like toddlers and tiaras. She said that being made to look like somebody she wasn't and made pretty for so many years meant that when it ended, she didn't know who she was. Starting off this countdown at number 10, we have Phoebe Cates. At the peak of her career in the 80s, she would be cast in over 20 movies and was best known for starring in Gremlins and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Fame came fast for the former actress and with her new and busy career, she was thriving in the industry. So while being at the top of your career, why would you all of a sudden just end it at such a young age? Well, it turns out she was more concerned with motherhood than anything and after trying to be a mother of two, and a full-time actress, Phoebe decided to become a full-time mom instead. It has been 30 years since leaving the big screen, and overall, she's actually kept a very low profile while also opening up her own boutique in New York City. So apparently, rumor has it that if you actually go to her boutique, you might see her in there. Moving along to the next spot at number nine is Terrence Howard. The American actor has starred in numerous films and TV shows, but you'll probably recognize him most from the movie Iron Man or the TV series Empire. Once Terrence finished his role in the five year running show Empire, he vowed that he would never act again. He said that quitting acting meant that he didn't need to pretend anymore. And even though his future plans were unknown, he knew he wanted to focus on bringing truth to the world. Terrence would later go on more in depth of the truth of his retirement, where he says that he spent 37 years in the industry pretending to be people that he isn't. He began making discoveries of his personal life and goals, and he believes that he would rather be teaching the truth rather than fictional. A little vague of an explanation, but uh, whatever makes him happy. I'm still not understanding the truth part. Like, let us know the truth rather than saying I want to speak the truth, you know? Moving on to number eight is Rick Moranis. The Canadian actor may not ring a bell until you hear that he was the main character in the childhood classic, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Legendary movie. I love that movie. That was so fun. His acting career was filled mostly by 80s comedy movies as he starred in Ghostbusters, The Flintstones, and Parenthood. Having a successful career in the industry and well-known movies under his name, he would suddenly just disappear from the acting scene and no one really knew why at the time. The sudden retirement was sadly due to the death of his wife who passed away from cancer. Because of this, Rick would completely shift his time to dedicate himself to raising his two children, and he became a stay-at-home dad. The hiatus was only supposed to be a break, but eventually the break led to him not working on any movies ever since then. The former actor confesses that he does miss the people and nature of the film industry as parenting is just a very different lifestyle, but he made it clear that he has no regrets about his career decisions. Moving on to the next celebrity on this list, and number seven, we have Karen Parsons. The retired actress is most known for her beloved character on the culture defined show, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. After the show ended in 1996, it would have been likely that fans would follow Karen to her other acting endeavors, but she seemingly wasn't able to find success in any other roles. After constant devastation and little to show for it, she grew very frustrated and eventually would lose her passion for acting, making her just move on to other things. She started working for a nonprofit foundation called The Sweet Blackberry, which is a charity that is determined to teach children about black history heroes through films. In 2019, she also released a children's novel called How High the Moon, and then in 2020, another book called Flying Free. Moving on to the next spot at number six is Peter Ostrom. You might not know Peter just by his name, but you'll definitely know him from his iconic role in the 1971 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory as he played the main character, Charlie. After filming finished, the child star would be offered a three movie part deal, but Peter did not sign the contract. Peter's role and Willy Wonka would be his first and his last as he would decide to quit his acting career right before it took off at the age of 12. The quick decision would be made simply because he just fell in love with a different profession, I guess, or passion at the time since he was 12. The former child star enjoyed watching veterinarians at work on the animals that his family had, and because of this experience, it single-handedly changed his future as he became a veterinarian himself. Giving up the spotlight to become a veterinarian may seem like an odd decision, but acting was just 
not his passion, he says. And he found that career passion with being a veterinarian. Damn, he really chose horses over Willy Wonka movies. Taking the halfway spot at number five is Angus T. Jones. You may not recognize the name because, um, I wouldn't, but you definitely know him as the kid from the sitcom Two and a Half Men. He played in the show from 2003 all the way to 2013, and it seemed like we watched him basically grow up as he started the show at just nine years old, and when he left the show, he was 19. At one point in 2010, he was the highest paid child star in television, so it may come as a shock to you when he left just a few years later. The real reason that the young star left the show in Hollywood in general was because he became very dedicated to his fate and actually started slamming the TV show for how vulgar it was. He was in a moral conflict by being on the show because he just didn't feel that it followed his religion. So he eventually called it quits because of his religious beliefs and became a more normal young adult by attending college. The former actor would go on to study environmental studies, but would later transfer his major to Jewish studies. Now, the former child star is living in LA and is working as president of an event entertainment company. Taking the countdown by storm, at number four is held by the child star, Mara Wilson. You probably know her for her role in Matilda or Miss Doubtfire, but have you ever wondered where the promising young actress went? I always wondered until I started this job and I found out. Well, she played numerous characters as a child star and instead of continuing her acting career, she backed away from the industry at the young age of 13. Moving on to the future, in 2016, she became a writer and released an autobiography depicting her accidental fame, as she called it. The book highlighted the now retired actress and her struggle with growing older and feeling as if her appearance didn't fit the Hollywood standard. Furthermore, in her book, she states that at 13, she was faced with a decision to get cosmetic surgery, audition for cute and funny friend characters, or just accept herself and give up her acting career for good. And well, we all know what decision she made because I already said it. Now she's the full-time writer and director and has chosen a whole new life for herself. Moving on to one of the top three spots at number three is Jack Glee. The former actor has only been part of a handful of roles, but one of them includes the fan favorite TV series Game of Thrones. Jack played one of the main characters in the series from 2011 to 2014, but hasn't played in anything since. Due to the success of the show, Jack had the opportunity of acting for a living full time, but decided against it for very understandable reasons. In a statement made in an interview, Jack said that he stopped because he wasn't enjoying it as much as he used to. He mentioned that acting used to be something he did for fun with his friends or sometimes in the summer, it was once something that he very much enjoyed. But when you make a living from something, it kind of just changes your relationship with it sometimes. So once his time on Game of Thrones came to an end, he felt some sort of relief and just decided that his acting career would come to an end altogether. After his retirement, he went on to study philosophy in Dublin. Coming in our second place, we have Daniel Day-Lewis. The talented British actor has won three Oscars, all for Best Actor, four BAFTA awards, and has even been knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. But his acting days in Hollywood are over after his representative released a statement in 2017 stating that Daniel will no longer be working as an actor, adding that it was a private decision and that he will not be making any further comments on the subject. This statement was released after receiving his third and final Oscar for his role in Phantom Thread. So it came as a surprise, because he just won. After being silent on the matter for quite some time, Daniel would later confess in an interview that quitting acting was something he had to do. This was due to overwhelming amount of sadness he faced while working on the film Phantom Thread. He even acknowledged that before making the film, he had no intention of quitting. So it's basically the movie's fault. Daniel also mentioned that he still can't quite figure out exactly what triggered him to quit for good after that movie, but said that he just needed to start to believe in the responsibility and values of what it means to be an actor. Now, being retired for a few years, he feels a different type of sadness, but in a good nostalgic way, he says, when looking back at his acting days. He could come back at any moment, really, right? You can leave and come back. Making our way to number one is Janet McCurdy. Former child star played a leading role in Nickelodeon show iCarly and would move on to co-star on Sam and Cat alongside Ariana Grande. That being said, her acting career would not go further beyond Nickelodeon and it came to an end in 2014. Though it was short lived, she had a very successful career in Hollywood but confessed that she resented it. This resentment was due to many factors. Firstly, it was because she started acting at six years old, which she was put into acting by her mom. and by 
by 10, she was the main financial support of her family. She never wanted to be in the industry, but forced herself to continue because she felt pressured to do so for the well being of her family. The former actress grew extremely unhappy, especially when she was at the peak of her career. When she initially made the decision to call it quits, her agents and managers said that she would be crazy to leave during such a high part in her career, but she stuck to her word and she hasn't looked back since. With the 2021 reboot of her show iCarly, she still would not get involved, which fans were genuinely surprised by. But thankfully, after announcing her retirement, she went on to become a writer and director, giving her a lot more satisfaction in her career. Taking spot number 10 on our countdown list is Gilbert Gottfried. If you've ever wondered if a tweet would be enough to end your entire Hollywood career, the answer is yes. Back in 2011, the comedian decided to send out some tweets that only he thought was funny. It was following the tragic tsunami that happened in Japan and took the lives of over 15,000 people. In the midst of it, he tweeted out a handful of insensitive jokes about it. Some of them are just a bit too risky to say here on YouTube, but one of them said, I will quote it, I just split up with my girlfriend, but like the Japanese say, there'll be another one floating by any minute now. At the time, he was the voice of Affleck Duck and they fired him immediately, which is not shocking. He issued an apology immediately after seeing the damage he had done, but he was instantly blacklisted from Hollywood. He now does cameo, if you're wondering what he's up to these days, and he even has a podcast that many people didn't even know about. Moving on to number nine, we have Danny Mathers. She is known for starring on TV series like The Bold and the Beautiful and Badass, but she's mainly known for her work as a Playboy model. Unfortunately, both sides to her career came to an end after she did something very petty and disrespectful online, and then got a taste of instant karma. Back in 2016, she posted an image on her social media of a naked 70 year old woman at the gym and captioned it, if I can't unsee this, then you can't either. She immediately got backlash from her post because it was extremely rude and also very invasive since the woman did not give her consent to take her nude photo and then post it. Her post resulted in her facing criminal charges and she also got fired from her radio show and banned from all the LA fitness gyms across the US. In 2017, she faced the court and pleaded no contest to a charge of invasion of privacy. She was also charged $1,000 and was ordered to spend a month doing community service of removing graffiti around Los Angeles. Moving on to number eight is Lance Armstrong. While he will always be known for his success as the greatest cyclist of all time, he will also be known as an athlete who lost everything due to a doping scandal. For many years, he was supported and admired for being an incredible athlete and also a cancer survivor who inspired others. Which is why it was so shocking to fans when the US Anti-Doping Agency announced that he was running the biggest doping program the sport has ever seen. Their statement read, he ran the most sophisticated, professionalized, and successful doping program the sport has ever seen. He later ended up admitting during an interview with Oprah that he had been taking the substance, which of course is a huge no-no in sports. He was stripped from his cycling titles and dropped by all of his sponsors, including Nike Inc. and Livestrong. On top of that, he was banned from professional cycling races altogether. He ended up reaching a $5 million settlement with the government, but his career career has just never been the same since. In 2020, a documentary called Lance came out on Netflix and it does a deep dive on his career and the whole scandal. So if you want to know the deets, go watch. In spot number seven, we have Chrissy Teigen. In recent months, she has been in the biggest scandal of her career after being accused of online bullying. It all started when Courtney Sodden accused her of bullying for years on Twitter and then even shared screenshots of private messages and tweets of Chrissy saying very rude and inappropriate things. Some of the tweets are so bad, she was actually wishing death upon her and told her to take her own life. The tweets are from the past, but people were shocked to see them and couldn't believe that she would ever behave like that. Chrissy had to step down from her role in Never Have I Ever season two, where she was supposed to be the voiceover role. It was later announced that she was actually replaced with Gigi Hadid. After seeing the backlash, she publicly apologized to her fans and also Courtney, taking full responsibility for what she did. But it seems like that hasn't been enough, and even she admitted to paparazzi very recently that she could be canceled forever. She doesn't know yet. 
Making her way into number six, we have Paula Dean. For many years, she was the face of the Food Network, but then a lawsuit took the title away from her and her career collapsed in front of her. The chaos all started when another celebrity chef, Lisa Jackson, accused her of racial discrimination, claiming that she used the N word when talking about African Americans. Lisa was actually her former general manager, so it was crazy to see someone who was once very close to her turn against her and then reveal the truth. When Paula was asked if she has ever used the N word, her response was this, I quote, Yes, of course, it's just what they are. They're jokes. Most jokes are about Jewish people, rednecks, black folks. I can't determine what offends another person. This was not the answer people were hoping for. I think most people expected an apology maybe or for her to admit how disrespectful and wrong it was. But no, apparently it's jokes. Fox News then obtained quotes that she has said over her career where she made a variety of comments that a lot of people would find offensive. Immediately, networks canceled her TV programs worldwide and she has had to go to court to defend her case. We have made it halfway through this list and at number five, we have Jesse Smollett. His scandal took the world by storm in 2019 and is still ongoing to this day. On January 29th, 2019, a news article surfaced saying that he was in the hospital after being attacked by two men who allegedly allegedly put a rope around his neck, beat him, and then poured chemicals on him. The reports claimed that the attackers were yelling racial and homophobic slurs, so it was being treated as a hate crime. The media and his fans came together online to support him through what seemed to be this horrific incident. The two suspects were arrested, but in court, they revealed that it was actually all set up by Justy and showed a check that he paid them to stage the entire thing. On February 20th, First, he was arrested on suspicion of filing a false police report and was charged with six counts of lying to police, all of which he pleaded not guilty to. But prosecutors ended up dropping the charges, which the Chicago police were not happy with, and they argued that the actor got off scot-free. In more recent times, an investigator has been hired since then to further investigate and prosecute him, so the scandal is still not over. Rolling into spot number four is Tila Tequila. I have not heard of her in a long time. At one point in time though, you could find her everywhere, starring on her own reality show, A Shot at Love with Tila Tequila, which ran for two successful seasons. I watched some of it. She got tons of attention on social media, but it started getting very negative when she started posting some very offensive things. One of them pushed her career over the edge in 2013 when she started praising Al and posted a rant titled, Why I Sympathize with if you think that's bad, it got even worse in 2016 when she and her friends posed for a photo saluting like a Her Twitter account was suspended shortly after and she was removed from the reality show Celebrity Big Brother. She was pretty much blacklisted in Hollywood at that point and no one wanted to work with her for the sake of their careers. She is now a married mother of two and has a YouTube channel, which is also filled with very controversial and strange videos. Taking over our third spot is Army Hammer. 2020 was a rough year for the actor's career after some disturbing claims came out from his former girlfriends. The claim said that he was a cannibal and that he would take his disturbing BDSM fantasies too far in their intimate relationship. His one ex, Paige Lorenz, claimed he would tie her up, use a paddle, and leave her with bruises, but her to a point of breaking the skin and even carved his initials into her body during a kinky game. She described the situation as 50 shades of gray, but without the love. Since the claims came out, his career has taken a huge hit. He was dropped from Billion Dollar Spy and his reputation has just been severely damaged. An investigation by the LAPD was filed against him after allegations said he had sexually assaulted some women in his past. In June of 2021, just last month, he checked himself into a treatment program and sources say it is because he could not handle everything that has been going on. Sources say he checked into an inpatient facility for substance, alcohol, and sex issues. In our number two spot is Roseanne Barr. Another time that tweets ruin someone's career. I think we can all learn something from this. Maybe think before you tweet. The actress and comedian was once on top of the world with her own ABC show called Roseanne, but that all ended in May 2018. 
She sent out some racist tweets referring to Valerie Jarrett, who was the senior advisor to the former president, Barack Obama. In her tweet, she compared Valerie to a cross between the Muslim Brotherhood and the movie Planet of the Apes. People were immediately furious and disgusted with her words, and no one thought it was funny even though she was claiming that it was a joke. After seeing the backlash she was getting, she deleted the tweet and apologized, but ABC had already cancelled her show, which was actually supposed to air that day. In interviews after that, when talking about the controversy, she still laughs it off and continues to say that it was a joke. We are at number one and we have Chris Brown. The singer forever changed his reputation and career back in 2009 when he faced felony charges. It's honestly hard to forget the horrible altercation that happened between he and his then girlfriend Rihanna when he was charged with felony assault. Photos surfaced at the time showing Rihanna's face all battered and bruised. He ended up pleading guilty to the charges and was sentenced to serve five years probation and 1400 hours of community service. After the incident, he was very very open and honest in interviews and actually admitted to punching her in the face, calling himself a monster. His career has never been the same since, but Rihanna ended up forgiving him. She originally had a restraining order against him, of course, but she later dropped that and said that the two of them are still very close friends. Starting off our list at number 10 is Billie Eilish. She is currently the world's biggest 17 year old when it comes to stardom. The moody singer songwriter has a reputation for making unique music videos that always go viral. Viral. She first made her name known in the music scene when she came out with the surprise hit Ocean Eyes back in 2016. And even though she is one of the world's biggest pop stars right now, she often goes against that typical pop star image that you would see. She is a fan of her own passion for the art, but she is not a fan of the fame that comes with it. She beats the norm when it comes to Hollywood standards, and she has no problem sharing her thoughts about it. During interviews, she said, Fame is horrible. It's worth it because it lets me play shows and meet people, but fame itself is effing dreadful. In another interview, she was asked what it was like taking on Hollywood at such a young age, and she replied with, There is no training. There's no like, let me go to school that's going to teach me how to be famous. Also, that would suck. That would be a trash school. Famous people suck. Fame is trash. Damn, Billy, tell us how you really feel. In at number nine is Amy Schumer. The comedian hates Hollywood so much she made a whole episode about the downfalls of fame. In one of her stand up sketches, she joked about how being famous isn't fun and that she's going to pull a Justin Bieber and stop taking pictures with fans. This wasn't for no reason though, it was after a man harassed her while asking for a photo. She also went off about what it was really like to go to the Met Gala that a lot of people dream of being invited to. During an interview on the Howard Stern Show, she confessed that going to the gala felt like, and I quote, felt like punishment. When asked about the dresses, she said, we were dressed up like a bunch of effing assholes. She explained that it feels like people doing an impression of having a conversation and that it was all very farce. Schumer even admitted to leaving the event early and said, I left, not the second I could. I left earlier than I should have been allowed. I got to meet Beyonce and she was like, is this your first gala? And I was like, it's my last. I think it's safe to say that she probably won't be invited to the next one. Swipe so our number eight spot is Selena Gomez. Fans were shocked when she decided to cancel part of her Revival World Tour and enter treatment for depression and anxiety. She opened up to Vogue about why she checked herself into a facility in Tennessee. She said, Tours are a really lonely place for me. My self esteem was shot. I was depressed, anxious. Basically, I felt I wasn't good enough and wasn't capable. It's hard to believe she would feel lonely when she's constantly surrounded by millions of fans who adore her, but she said that there's social anxiety that comes with that. Along with fame and Hollywood comes social media, to which she has been named the most popular celebrity on Instagram, having a current total of 152 million followers. It's one part of Hollywood that she says is a love-hate relationship. She blames social media for her struggles with image and mental health, but also loves the platform it gives to connect with her fans. It seems like people in Hollywood are a lot lonelier than we would think. I always thought, like, how can you be lonely when there are always people around you? But it just goes to show that it roots a lot deeper than just having people physically there. Taking over our number seven spot is Gigi Hadid. The 23-year-old is one of the biggest models on the planet, and she admits that fame hasn't been the easiest thing to take on. A few months ago in April of 2019, she spoke to Variety 
about her career and discussed how she's dealt with Hollywood and living life in the spotlight. She even got emotional while speaking about it and said, I quote, at times fame makes you feel out of control of your life. I think it's tough. Obviously people judge you. People can create a headline or an opinion about someone based on a small moment or a mistake. Back in 2017, she also spoke with Harper's Bazaar where she revealed her time in Hollywood has had a huge impact on her circle of friends. She said a lot of things in friends come out when someone gets famous and that she has lost a lot of friends because of it. She did admit that in some way it's a good thing because you find out who your real friends are, but that fame plays an effect on every aspect of her life. When talking about her passion for modeling, she admits that she always knew she wanted to support herself and have the creative freedom she has now to shape her own life. Seems like she is grateful for that aspect, but just wishes things could be a little bit easier. At number six is Vanessa Hudgens. Her career began and took off with Disney and she's fully admitted the struggle she has faced to shed that innocent Disney image that you get held above your head. Luckily, she's been able to continue an acting career and a successful one at that. Not only did she hate the judgment she faced when moving on from Disney, but she also hates just fame in general. During an interview, she said, I don't like the word fame. Some people like the idea of fame. I don't like the idea of fame. I like being an actress. It's different. She often tries to express the difference between wanting to be an actor and wanting to be famous. She says that people often link them together since fame just naturally comes when you are a Hollywood actor. But she once told Daily Telegraph, I became an actress and started singing and dancing because I truly loved it. I did not want to be a celebrity. I think fame is just something that comes along when you are in something that is such a success. Like other stars on this list, she hates media and paparazzi and the fact that everyone just tries to get in your business. She says that it becomes crippling. Halfway through our list at number five is Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. I know they are two people, but there's no way I'm giving these twins two different spots. So they are a two for one package deal. Their fame skyrocketed in the 1990s and 2000s with their first role on the hit TV series Full House, which they were on from the time that they were literally infants. As the twins continued to grow their empire, becoming the youngest billionaires at one point in time, it was clear that they wanted to leave that Hollywood limelight. They ended up both leaving their acting careers and more recently declined to be a part of the Full House reboot. Ashley admitted that she feels uncomfortable with acting now and Mary Kate claimed that it was just awful timing for her. The two of them have been very vocal on how they hate the attention they get and they do everything they can not to be in the spotlight. During an interview with Vogue, they explained that they have chosen to stay off social media all these years. Mary Kate said, we've spent our whole lives trying to not let people have that accessibility. It's their way of avoiding the things that they dislike about Hollywood and it seems to be working pretty well for them. Taking the number four spot is Katy Perry, another star who wants success in Hollywood just without the fame. She loves creating music but is over the whole famous thing apparently. One thing the singer has strived to do is show that her life in Hollywood comes with a heavy price and sometimes people don't want to pay for it anymore, if you know what I mean. This is why she created a full length movie called Part of Me which documented her entire concert tour back in 2012. She wanted people to see what it is really like to be a pop star, the good, the bad, and all the behind the scenes that actually goes into putting on those kinds of shows. When asked about her thoughts on fame, she said, I'm tired of being famous already, but I'm not tired of creating. Fame is, I think, just a disgusting byproduct of what I do. She continues to try and show her fans that she's relatable and isn't what people think all Hollywood stars are. All right, guys, at number three is Lady Gaga. The star comes across confident as hell, but she has opened up about her struggles with fame and the pain Hollywood can cause. She revealed a lot of emotions with CBS Sunday Morning and said, as soon as I go out into the world, I belong in a way to everyone else. It's legal to follow me. It's legal to stalk me at a beach. I can't call the police or ask them to leave. She got teary eyed speaking on the subject and said that she has no freedom in her everyday life, but has freedom in her heart, which comes out through her music. One thing she hates the most is how everyone recognizes her in public because it has completely transformed her interactions with people. She says, I miss people. I miss, you know, going anywhere and meeting a random person and saying hi and having a conversation about life. I love people. I mean, what an eye opener that is. We can literally like go up to any anyone on the streets and say hi. And she will literally never be able to do that ever again because she'll always be recognized as Lady Gaga. Here we are at number two with Sia. It's no surprise that Sia is in Hollywood, but really doesn't want to be. She wants to share her music with the world, but not her private life, not even her face. She's the first celebrity to cover her face at all times during interviews, red carpets, performances, literally everything. For years, very few people had actually seen her without a wig covering her face. At first, the world just thought it was all part of her act, maybe part of her character as an artist, but she's been open about her reasoning and says it's everything to do with hating fame. During an interview, she said, if anyone besides famous people knew what it was 
like to be a famous person, they would never want to be famous. I don't want to be famous or recognizable. I don't want to be critiqued about the way that I look on the internet. I've been writing pop songs for pop stars now for a couple of years and I've become friends with them and see what their life is like and that's not something I want. She was very successful at hiding her image and loved that she was able to go out and do simple things like grocery shopping. No one would even know that it was Sia because no fans or media sources actually knew what she looked like. Since then, she has showed up to a few events without a wig, but still maintains a very low profile. Taking our number one spot is the adored Justin Bieber. Over the last few years, we've watched the pop star cancel his tour and walk away from his music career. Not only that, but he's also walked away from Hollywood as a whole. In September 2018, he announced that he was settling and living full time in Ontario, Canada with his new wife, Haley Baldwin. Sources say he felt that living in his home country was the right thing to do at this point in his life. This way, he doesn't feel the pressures of Hollywood and has the chance to actually have some privacy. He discussed his struggles of being in the spotlight during an NME interview saying, I'm struggling just to get through the day. You get lonely, you know, when you're on the road. People see the glam and the amazing stuff, but they don't know the other side. This life can rip you apart. He went into more detail explaining the isolation of camping out in hotel rooms trying to avoid fans and paparazzi. Since moving to Canada, he has been able to focus on his mental health, which he says Hollywood once destroyed. Number 10, Chadwick Boseman. The late, great Chadwick Boseman was not just an incredible performer, but an incredible man. In his early years of acting, no matter what his status was, he was always vocal about the things that he did not agree with or understand. During a commencement speech to the graduating class of 2018 at his alma mater, Howard University, he spoke about a time when he was fired from a show for questioning the producers about the stereotypical depiction of his character. At first he was excited as he was promised a six-figure contract, more money than he'd ever seen in his life. However, the moment he saw the role that he was playing, he was conflicted. The role was wrapped up in assumptions about people of color. He said that the character was just a young man with a violent streak pulled into the allure of gangs and with zero glimpse of positivity or talent in the character. After filming a handful of episodes, Chadwick brought his concerns to the attention of the producers who told him that they were very pleased with his performance, a performance that he was actually fired from the next day. Apparently, the things that he was asking caught the producers off guard. The conversation over the character actually came up when he was called into the production office, and they were very happy with what he'd been doing on the show, and it was clear they wanted him around for a long time. But when they asked him if he needed anything to be more comfortable, it was his opening. He asked them if they could just discuss his character a bit for plot purposes, asking them only two questions. Where is my father? And if my mother is not equipped to be a good parent, why did myself and my brother need to go to foster care? While the producers did have answers, when Chadwick asked if they felt that he was a stereotypical character at all, the producers stared for a moment before suggesting that he speak to the writers if he had any suggestions. The goal was to give his character a new lease on life, but the next day, he was fired for speaking his mind, something he's never regretted once and that never stopped him from pursuing his dreams. Number 9. Sylvester Stallone Considering the success of the Beverly Hills Cop franchise, it's difficult to imagine anyone else in the leading role of Alex Foley other than Eddie Murphy. But it turns out that at the time, the role was initially offered to one of the biggest stars of the 1980s, Sylvester Stallone. What's funny still is that at the time, he was not just a skilled actor, but earning an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay for Rocky. But it seems that Rocky and the studio didn't really agree on many things, and eventually Stallone was exited from the project. One of the first major changes in Sly's version of the script was the violence. He wanted it to be ramped up to 100 and make it a real action movie. But the film was presented to him as a comedy. Even though he agreed to do it, he wanted to make some changes before the cameras rolled. He was exclusively told not to change anything about the film, but he insisted and rewrote the project as a 50-50 action comedy movie. When he presented the changes to the producers, they were not pleased with his script, in fact quite the opposite. It was quickly decided that Sylvester would be let go as the lead and Eddie Murphy would be brought in to fill in the blanks. It was not in vain as he took that mangled script, incorporated elements of the novel Fair Game by Paula Gosling, and eventually it became the 1986 film Cobra. Although it wasn't loved by critics, it did go on to make around $160 million globally, which pretty good at the time. Number eight, Edward Norton. Three-time Academy Award nominee Edward Norton has been the leading man in many memorable movies, Primal Fear, American History X, and of course the most famous one, but as we all know, 
But of course, one of his most famous and mainstream roles was in the 2008 MCU flick, The Incredible Hulk. Although the movie was not a massive success at first, the audience was shocked when Edward Norton was replaced by Mark Ruffalo in the first Avengers film. The president of Marvel Studios, Kevin Feige, said that the decision was not monetary, but it was actually due to the company wishing to hire an actor who embodied the creativity and collaboration that the other Marvel stars had so far shown on their projects. After Kevin made these statements, However, Norton was amicable but adamant about splitting ways with Marvel and mentioned that his roles in Birdman and Moonrise Kingdom would oppose the loud and extravagant role that he had in the MCU. Many believe that his calm response may be because he was paid handsomely before he was let go as a little bit of hush money. Marvel is good at hiding secrets, especially from their actors, but it was still so early in the MCU that Edward was certainly aware of hidden details and events that would make him a liability in the industry. Number seven, Colin Firth. The live-action Paddington movies are surprisingly very popular. The series, based on the children's book, has really hit home for a lot of people. The first and second film are currently rated at 97% and 99% fresh, respectively. 99. The success of the film can of course be attributed to the incredible cast, including the voice of Paddington, Ben Wishaw. But of course, Ben was not the first voice that had been recorded for the role. Initially, the voice of Paddington was done by Kingsman star Colin Firth. I know he's been in other things, but I love those movies and that's how I know him best. Not only did Colin record all of the lines start to finish, but he was not told that he was being replaced until a couple of months before the premiere. In some of the first promotional videos for the film, the animated bear never does anything more than grunt. It turns out that the creative team felt Colin's voice just didn't match with the vibe that they were going for. It made Paddington sound too old and distinguished when he needed to be some fresh young thing. Yeah, he was just happy to be working. Now let's get into some more dark Hollywood backstories, shall we? Number six, Jim Carrey's Origins. A Canadian legend, Jim is considered one of the greatest modern comedians of all time, famously releasing three films in the year 1995, Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, and Ace Ventura, which all made millions at the box office and still hold up to this day. As many know, comedians tend to have a pretty rough backstory as the best comedy comes from a place of pain. Over the years, Jim has come clean about his strange but fun upbringing. His family struggled financially, and he grew up watching his mother struggle with depression, which he claims to have passed down to him. Despite his energy, he was a bit of a recluse growing up and apparently spent hours in his room making faces in the mirror instead of hanging out with him. After dropping out of high school to work a full-time job, Jim and his family were forced to live in a Volkswagen van together, becoming homeless for a short period of time. He went on to attempt a career in comedy at first to minimal success, but of course he was able to find his footing and made his place in comedy history. Number five. Woody Harrelson's father. Woody is best known in Hollywood as the wildest wild child to ever exist. He eats raw meat. He's an eco-crusader, a protester against violence, and an advocate for the legalization of herbs and spices in the United States. He's loved on screen, but did you know that his father took people out for money? And I'm not talking about on dates. Charles Harrelson was sentenced to two lifetime sentences for the first, the slaying of a federal judge in San Antonio. Prior to that charge, Charles had previously been acquitted for the slaying of Alan Berg, a carpet salesman, and convicted of the slaying of Sam DeGalia Jr. Yeah, the evidence shows that Charles was not a great Woody doesn't speak much of his father these days, opting to instead leave his family troubles in the past. He does, however, say that the one thing that his father said to him that he still uses to this day was, always keep an open mind. Yeah, Charles knew all about opening minds. You can't put that in the video, that's just for the editor. I just did. Number four, Mark Wahlberg should be in jail. Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch hit the rap scene in 1991. Despite sounding like the title of a cheesy kids show, the crew had a small following and garnered a lot of success, enough for leading man Mark Wahlberg to be spotted and picked up by Hollywood to star in The Corrupter, a 1999 action flick that sees Mark playing the leading man. Action by the numbers, kinda get it. He's had a successful acting career that has recently been declining in quality, but he's still acting and looks jacked at the age of 50 something. So please don't hurt me, Mark Wahlberg. Infinite was just hard to watch. Growing up in Boston, he was the youngest of nine children and was relentlessly bullied by his fellow siblings. His parents divorced when he was very young and he became addicted to no-no snow by the age of 13. He dropped out of high school and was eventually arrested when he was 18 for attempting to slay two Vietnamese men. Apparently, he was just walking home late one night under the influence of a hallucinogen narcotic that I won't get into. When he spotted the men, 
Close friends at the time confirmed that Mark had a racial biased upbringing, which caused him to be instantly aggressive towards anyone who, you know, wasn't white. He attempted to swing a large log at them, which made contact and knocked one of them unconscious, and he was eventually released after serving only 45 days of his two-year prison sentence, and he vowed to change his life. So far, he's kept that promise. I can personally confirm that he's very polite and patient because he actually watched a movie at a theater I used to work at. He travels with a crew of five people at all times. It's a little intimidating. Number three, Tim Allen's hobbies. Tim Allen is the voice of Buzz Lightyear and the star of ABC's sitcom Home Improvement, which premiered in 1991. Now, while he may have played a family man on TV, many fans may not know that Tim was a smuggler of no-no snow in the early 1970s. According to Tim, he got mixed up with some bad people back in the day while he was selling certain substances on the street for a couple of bucks. In 1978, Tim was arrested in the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport, that's an awesome name, and was caught with more than 650 50 grams, 1.4 pounds of no-no snow. Unfortunately for Tim, state legislators had just passed a law that tied a life sentence to any conviction of selling 650 or more. Like, as he was being arrested, there was a guy in his car like, okay, and if you have six, how many? 650 grams. Okay, yeah, you're a goner, Tim. However, that sentence was never served as it was revealed that Tim was set up by an undercover police officer who had been following him for months. Due to this and Tim's cooperation in providing the names of fellow dealers to the authorities led to him receiving a lighter conviction that allowed him to be sentenced in a federal court instead of a state one, being able to ignore that new policy altogether. His information led to 20 arrests and the sentencing of a major dealer. That needs to be a movie. Number two, they have backups. There have been many rumors over the years that Hollywood likes to clone their best and brightest on the off chance that they will need them again following an untimely demise. According to the internet, Paul Rudd actually got to star alongside his clone in the show Living With Yourself, not some CGI thing. Now, Paul has, of course, claimed the performance was achieved with CGI and filming one character one day and another the next, but come on, Paul Rudd's also 54 and looks, well, like that. Something's not right about that. Now, there is a theory out there that celebrities are made up of lizard people who take the forms of actors and singers to influence people. Paul is thought to be one of those lizard people. I don't know. I don't believe this theory. I'm just sharing some stuff I found on the internet. Just, I don't believe any of this, okay? I'm just, this is fun. It would be awesome if there were two Paul Rudds though. In fact, that would probably be the most chill way to find out that clones existed. Just two Pauls being like, hi, I'm Paul. And another one being like, hi, I'm Paul. And everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> Number one, they're all broke. That's right, despite it being one of the most lucrative industries in the world, most of Hollywood actors, writers, directors, all of them are not as well off as people may think. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last little bit, most of Hollywood was closed for a while as its staff were on strike. Some of the toppest of tier actors joined the crew in solidarity, and they are actually still on strike right now. Not stopping until Hollywood's producers and big budget studios start sharing the money they make. Actor Sean Gunn gave an interview a few weeks ago where he mentioned working on a show currently streaming on Netflix, a show that has made over $4 million in residuals of which he has received basically nothing. This type of financial woe extends to a ton of people in Hollywood. Just wanted to take a moment to wish luck to anyone who's still out there and hey, awesome that the writer part of the strike is over. That's pretty sick. Born Billie Eilish pirate Baird O'Connell on December 18, 2001, she is an American singer and songwriter who has hit the big leagues at just the young age of 17. However, her following began long before. She gained a notable following in 2016 when she released her single Ocean Eyes on SoundCloud and subsequently released on the record's labels Dark Room and Interscope Records. Now, her early life consisted of homeschooling, during which time she joined the LA Children's Chorus at the age of eight. Just a few short years later, she would begin writing songs, taking after her elder brother, Phineas O'Connell, who was already writing, performing, and producing his own songs with his band. More interesting still, Billy's song Ocean Eyes was actually written by Phineas for his own band. Don't know about you, but I wouldn't be too happy about that. Now, here's where things begin to get fishy. Phineas is dating YouTuber Claudia Saluski, who looks a whole lot like Billie Eilish, which has led some fans to believe that Phineas is dating Claudia simply because she looks like his sister. Especially 
especially considering how oddly close him and Billy are. Anyway, I digress. Back to Ocean Eyes. The song was released as Billy's debut single back in 2016, and the song was certified platinum not long after, peaking at number 84 on the Billboard Hot 100 in May 2019. That very same year, Billy also released the single Six Feet Under, which didn't do as well, but was still a success for the rising star. Following the huge success of Ocean Eyes, Billy released the single Belly Ache on February 24, 2017, with the single Bored coming shortly after, which was used as part of the soundtrack to the Netflix series 13 Reasons Why. However, her rise from the ashes came in 2018, arguably her biggest year along with 2019, which saw the singer embark on the Where's My Mind tour, as well as the release of her vinyl featuring an acoustic version of her song Party Favor, as well as a cover of Drake's Hotline Bling. Now in 2019, When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go was finally released on March 29, 2019, with the album debuting at number one on the Billboard 200, as well as on the UK Albums Chart, in turn making Billy the first artist born in the 2000s to have a number one album in the United States and the youngest female ever to have a number one album in the United Kingdom. Bold flex, big moves. Nothing but respect for my queen. However, her biggest flex would come when her fifth single, Bad Guy, was released in conjunction with her album, and it peaked at number one in the US, in turn ending Lil Nas X record breaking 19 weeks at number one with Old Town Road. She's also the youngest artist to perform at Coachella, surpassing Lord. Now, outside of music, Billie has a massive public image with constant media attention that tends to mostly focus on her fashion style, which consists primarily of baggy, ill fitting clothing, very Adam Sandler-esque. Back in 2017, Billie actually addressed the attention surrounding her style choices, saying that she likes dressing out of her comfort zone to feel like she grabs the attention of everyone around her. However, in 2019, Billie also appeared in a Calvin Klein ad, wherein she mentioned that she dresses in baggy clothes in order to prevent people from body shaming her. I respect that so much. Now, in her personal life, Billie has stated that she actually has Tourette's syndrome, which is a common neurodevelopment disorder characterized by multiple motor tics and at least one vocal tic. She also has synesthesia in which people associate colors with numbers, even music. Billy also has previously stated that she was raised vegetarian and is a big advocate for veganism on social media. Now, let's jump into the meat of this video, why we're all here. The scary theory surrounding this artist, as we know every now and then a conspiracy theory pops up that just refuses to go away. This is one of those. The Illuminati is one of the biggest theories around, with many believing that the world's most powerful people secretly control the world. Ridiculous, right? Well, according to some theorists, the latest member of the society is none other than Billie Eilish. Now, this is entirely based on the imagery used in Billie's music video, All the Good Girls Go to Hell, which strongly features apocalyptic type imagery. And ever since its release, fans have taken to Twitter to discuss how convinced they are that Billie is in the Illuminati. I quote, So Billie Eilish single-handedly brought the Illuminati back in 2019. And she's in the Illuminati. There's no point kicking off about it because it ain't gonna change anything. And Billie Eilish is the new face of the Illuminati, I guess. I guess. However, other folks went in a different direction with the theories, with one person stating, I quote, All good girls go to hell, and bury a friend feature satanic messages. On Reddit, people have come up with their own theories as well, specifically about how Billy may be involved with the Illuminati. Now, this theory is utterly twisted, with the theorists stating that Billy may have indirectly killed late rapper XXS Tentacion, which thereby influenced the song Bury a Friend. The theory also says that in order to gain entry into the secret society, the candidate has to kill someone. Someone. So, there we go. At the end of the day, it seems like these rumors are simply that. Rumors. And that Billy is likely not a part of the Illuminati. At least, I don't think so anyway. After all, if the group really did exist and she actually was a member, would she make it so obvious? Starting off this countdown, we have Meg Ryan, Dennis Quaid, and Russell Crowe. Meg Ryan was married to Dennis Quaid for nine years until she decided to cheat on him with Russell Crowe. This happened while filming the movie Proof of Life with Russell in Ecuador. Somehow, news got out about Ryan and Crow, and Quaid soon filed for divorce. But Ryan turned it around, saying that the divorce was all Quaid's fault, and that he had also been unfaithful during their marriage. In the end, Ryan lost Crow and Quaid, and the movie tanked in the box office. So, maybe that's karma. Moving on to number nine, we have Aaron Carter, Hilary Duff, and Lindsay Lohan. Back in the early 2000s, Aaron Carter was quite the heartthrob and ladies' man, catching the the hearts of fans and celebrities all around the world. Well, Aaron met Hillary when he guest starred in the Lizzie McGuire Christmas special. You guys remember that? 
Smash that like button, cause I do. Then on his 13th birthday, the pair officially began dating. They were together for almost two years when he cheated on her with Lindsay Lohan. In fact, he was two timing her. So he was dating Lindsay and Hillary at the same time. Now this is what Aaron had to say. I started dating Hillary on my 13th birthday. I was dating her for like a year and a half and then I just got a little bored. So I went and I started getting to know Lindsay, dating Lindsay. Then I didn't want to do that anymore so I got back with Hillary. And then I ended up cheating on Hillary with her best friend. That's nothing to smile about. She wasn't even that good looking either. End of quote. I didn't just add that in. He also said that. So he literally got bored and was like, sure, let's fool around with other women. She's Aaron. In our eighth spot today, we have Laura Dern, Billy Bob Thornton, and Angelina Jolie. Honestly, people might hate me for saying this, but Billy Bob Thornton and Angelina Jolie were a hot couple. I'm sorry. Well, Laura Dern and Billy Bob started dating in 1997 while on the set of Ellen. The couple dated for three years and even were engaged. But in 1999, he called it quits, and a year later, he married Angelina Jolie. That one's gotta hurt. According to Dern, she said, and I quote, I left our home to work on a movie, and while I was away, my boyfriend got married, and I've never heard from him again. That is very harsh. Moving on to number seven, we have Alex Rodriguez, Kate Hudson, and Cameron Diaz. Now this dude has dated all the stars, I swear, like Madonna, JLo, come on now. Anyways, Kate Hudson and A-Rod dated for seven months before calling it quits in December of 2009. Just a few months later, Cameron Diaz was seen leaving his house with overnight bags, you guys know what that means. And according to sources, Hudson was not happy with this at all. Maybe this was payback for Hudson hooking up with Cameron's ex-boyfriend Justin Timberlake shortly after they broke up. Who knows? But in 2012, it seems like they got over this drama because they were quite chummy with each other at the Academy Awards. In 2013, Diaz referred to Hudson as one of her good friends. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Sophia Bush, Chad Michael Murray, and Paris Hilton. Now, Chad Michael Murray is one fine man, okay? Let me just say that. And I did not know that he got together with Paris Hilton, okay? I don't know, I just can't picture them together, you know? But I guess opposites attract. One Tree Hill star Sophia and Chad ended up having chemistry on and off screen. In December of 2005, they actually got married, but the marriage was very short-lived. Five months later, they separated. And apparently, Chad was spotted with Paris Hilton. Now, this is where it gets messy. So at the time the two allegedly got together, Paris was dating Nick Carter. Nick's younger brother, Aaron Carter, eventually spilled the tea, saying that Paris cheated on his brother with Chad Michael Murray. So they both cheated on their partners. A year later, Sophia and Chad filed for divorce. In our fourth spot, we have Kristen Stewart, Robert Pattinson, and Rupert Sanders. Now, I don't know if you remember when this drama came out, but I do. And that's because I was a hardcore Twilight fan, and I shipped Kristen and Robert to the moon and back. When I heard she cheated on him, I was so mad at her. Like, she doesn't even know who I was, but I was mad. Anyways, while filming Snow White and the Huntsman, Kristen got with the director, Rupert Sanders, and the two were caught kissing and public. Kristen was dating Robert at the time, and Rupert was married to Liberty Ross. Rob and Kristen separated for a bit, then got back together again, only to break up again in 2013. Whereas Rupert's wife filed for divorce in 2013. In our third spot today, we have David Spade, Laura Flynn Boyle, and Jack Nicholson. This is a very odd trio, but apparently Jack Nicholson stole David Spade's girlfriend, Laura Flynn Boyle, from him in 1999. According to him, that's what happened. They had been dating for a year when Jack literally asked her out in front of David. Now, David got all defensive being like, I know you're gonna go out with him anyway. And she was like, no way, he's worse than Trump. Like, no lie, that's what she said. But in the end, the two were spotted together. Actually, they got in a car crash together and apparently Boyle climbed out of the sunroof and yelled, I have a boyfriend, I can't be here. But she was caught, like literally red-handed. In our third spot today, we have Bella Thorne, her brother, and another Bella. Bella Thorne's brother, Remy Thorne, was dating a girl named Bella Pendergast for three years. The pair broke up around 2015. Bella Thorne was dating Greg Sulkin, and when she broke up, she quickly came out as bisexual on her Twitter. A little while later, she was spotted with her brother's ex being a little too close. They shared a number of photos holding hands and kissing, and people were like, is she seriously dating her brother's ex? And yes, the answer is yes, she did. 
But shortly after, Bella Thorne decided to go after Greg Sulkin's friend, Tyler Posey. Then a month later, she dumped him and was with Charlie Puth. And don't get me started with the whole Tana Modson relationship, okay? That's a whole other mess on its own. And in our number one spot today, we have Olivia Wilde, Jason Sudeikis, and Harry Styles. Now, I must be living under a bus because I love Jason Sudeikis, but I did not know that he was engaged to Olivia Wilde. The pair first met in 2011 and began dating a few months later. In 2012, they got engaged. And in 2014 and 2016, they gave birth to two children. But in 2020, the pair announced that they had split. A few months later, Olivia was spotted with Harry Styles after attending a wedding together. They both met during the movie Don't Worry Darling, and some believe that Styles might be one of the reasons as to why the two split. One source said, and I quote, Olivia called off the engagement in early November, but only after she had already gotten close to Harry. The source continued on saying, whether Harry knows it or not, he was the reason for the split, and it blindsided Jason. 